in Zoom. I'm not sure I know how to change it in Cisco WebEx, though. I'll, I'll look around. <laughs> That's all right. I, I figured out your secret. All right, so we're going to go ahead and call this meeting to order, and I'm sure that Terry is there and uh, getting us all sorted, um, as always, so that we can broadcast. So, this board meeting of the Board of Education for August 25th, 2020 is called to order. For tonight's meeting, any item that will be voted on this evening has been posted as required by state law. This meeting is being streamed live on PPT PD, PPS TV services website and on panel 28 and will be played throughout the next two weeks. Please check the district website for replay times. All right, welcome and thank you for joining us this evening, everyone. Um, I'm having a hard time believing that summer is already winding down and that our teachers are coming back to work this week in preparation to welcome our students on September 2nd. We're going to get another update on reentry, and I know we're all anxiously awaiting that. Um, many of us have questions about what it's going to look like for students, and I know that my sophomore at Cleveland High School is anxiously awaiting her schedule. Uh, but before we get to reentry, we're going to begin with the board consent agenda. Board members, are there any items you would like to pull um, to set aside for discussion to vote on at the end of meeting? So are there any items to pull from the consent agenda tonight? So just a quick question, is the resolution around um, the preschool measure, is that part of the consent agenda or has that been added somewhere else in the agenda? Or is that a separate that, agenda item? That, is se that will be separate than the cons consent agenda. Where is that gonna be on the agenda? It is, um, it will be right after the consent agenda. Okay, um, so I have, uh, three contracts I'd like to pull and ask questions about at the end of the meeting. Okay, great. Which of the three contracts are those, Director Brim Edwards? Um, open School, Immigrant and Refugee, Community Organization, and the IM Academy. Okay, so we will need to pull those from the consent agenda. Are there any other um, items that board members would like to pull from the consent agenda? Hearing none, I'm going to double check so that we have those resolution numbers correct. Uh, so we're pulling 6162, but not all of the contracts in 6162. So Liz, how do we um, uh, clarify that to make sure it's clear which contracts we're voting on and which ones we are not? So, it's, so the three contracts identified by Director Brim Edwards have been removed from the consent agenda. So you can recite the resolution as and 6162 as amended. Okay, great. And include the others that are in their original form. Okay. I'm actually, I'm actually going to have one question about the catapult one, but um, it's just one question, so I can, you can let that one go. I'll just ask the question. Okay. So we're just pulling the three that you've listed: Open School, I Am Academy, and um, ERCO. Correct. Correct. So then, uh, so do, Liz, do we need to we could just move to amend the resolution or is uh, Director Brim Edwards' request sufficient? Her request is sufficient. Excellent, okay. Um, Ms. Bradshaw, are there any other changes to the consent agenda? No. All right, do I have a motion and second to adopt the consent agenda? So moved. Second. I thought that so moved was Michelle, but was it Amy? Yes. Okay, because I'm like, I don't think Michelle's here, but I'm trying to uh, hear voices over speakers. So Director Constam moves and Director Brim Edwards seconds. Is there any board discussion on the consent agenda? So I just have one question, and um, I don't know if this is for um, Deputy Superintendent Hertz or um, Emily Courtnage with contracts, um, but it's about the contract term for the catapult learning. Do you want to include that in your questions at the end of the <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah, I, I'm happy to do that. Okay. Um, are there any as... other board discussion on the consent agenda? All right, the board will now vote on resolution 6162 as amended to 6164. 
All in favor, please indicate by saying yes. 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 Please indicate by saying no. Are there any abstentions? The consent agenda is approved by a vote of six to zero with student representative Shu voting. Yes. All right. Thank you, Nathaniel. All right, now we're gonna move on to the item that Director Brim Edwards referenced that Director Moore has requested some time to bring to the agenda. Director Moore, would you like to introduce uh, your item? Yes, thank you. Um, I would like to offer a resolution to endorse the measure on the November ballot that will establish a voluntary program of high quality tuition free universal preschool for all children in Multnomah County ages three to five. Um, early childhood education fosters a range of early um, early skills, including cognitive skills, social emotional development, and executive functions that are foundational for success in K-12 into it and into adulthood. Um, research over many decades has convincing, convincingly shown that participation in high quality, developmentally appropriate uh, preschool programs has a positive impact on all children, and especially for children of color and children living in poverty. But preschool has been out of reach for the majority of children in this county because of high costs and limited capacity. Oregon ranks fourth in the United States for the cost of childcare, and it's not unusual for families to pay upwards of 30 to 40 percent of their monthly income for preschool, even if they can find it. Um, there's been capacity to serve only about 43% of the children in Multnomah County. And in the aftermath of COVID, that capacity is expected to be substantially less. Uh, this ballot measure will support the development of a diverse network of preschool programs, uh, program options uh, over the next five years, prioritizing support for families who historically have had the least access to preschool including BIPOC families, families uh, of children with disabilities, families who speak languages other than English and who are experiencing poverty and economic challenges. Uh, moreover, in addition to preschools, clear benefits and better educational outcomes for children, public investments in universal high quality preschool have been shown to be one of the most effective economic development strategies uh, with a return of almost eight to $10 uh, uh, on every dollar invested. Um, high quality universal preschool is an infrastructure for families that allows parents to safely and securely participate in the economy and sets children up for educational success into adulthood. Um, I think this program could unlock enormous potential for children and families, um, and it's directly linked to PPS's success in fulfilling its core educational mission. So I am asking my colleagues to vote to endorse this ballot measure. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll bring forward the resolution with a motion and then we can have discussion on what Director Moore has brought to us. Um, so the board will now bring forward resolution number 6165, resolution in support of a ballot measure establishing, uh, ugh, establishing a universal preschool in Multnomah County. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Director Moore moves and Director Bailey seconds this motion. Uh, is there any board discussion? Hi, this is Director Constant. My only discussion is I sent a note to uh, Director Scott today asking him in his role as the um, head of the Intergovernmental um, uh, Relations Committee to um, really codify how we're going to go, what, what kind of process we're going to use for endorsing measures. We've talked about this for a while, but we haven't um, we haven't really set up a process and these things always seem to come to us hastily and they're brought to the board without deliberation and without criteria about, um, you know, whether or not we should or should not be weighing in. So um, if the intergovernmental committee could spend a little time just creating some, some parameters around that, I think that would be helpful for us and I support this measure. So this is Director Brim Edwards. Um, so I, I think that's a great suggestion. Um, I also think we should have some sort of process by which uh, resolutions get added. So this um, board members found out about it la last night, um, at least I did. Um, and it, I believe our process would was that anything that we were gonna be voting on needed to be 
um, part of the board packet that went out and posted on, on Thursday. So just again, getting a, some sort of established process. So it's not a sort of random um, activity um, and just also letting the public know that we're going to, you know, our agenda, anything we vote on should all be posted on Thursday or um, at least, you know, 24 hours in advance. Um, so I also actually had a question and I'm not sure, um, Director Moore, if you're the person to ask or if it's Courtney Wessling. And the question I have is, um, and I haven't been following this, um, well, I was following the preschool for all measure um, and had a pretty fair amount of engagement with uh, Commissioner Jessica Vega Peterson, but there was another measure that qualified for the for the ballot, and I'm looking at the Multnomah County website, and it's not clear. Um, there's, there's two ballot measures. Um, there was a reference to universal preschool, which makes it sound like not the one that the county referred. To the Rather, it's the one that this country is requested for. So I'm wondering, like. <laughs> Are there two measures going to the to the ballot, and what are the differences, and what is it that we're voting um, in support of? So there were two ballot measures that um, two measures that qualified for the ballot. Um, one was sponsored by the county. One was sponsored by, um, I believe, Democratic Socialists of America, um, and there were there were substantial conversations of over um, quite a long time between the two groups uh, in an attempt to um, come to some sort of agreement um, to avoid having two competing ballot measures around the same topic. And uh, just recently, a couple of weeks ago, um, they announced that they have merged um, and there will be only one ballot measure on the ballot um, for preschool. Um, they are, they're working on paperwork right now. So my understanding is that um, there will be, right now there, there is no uh, ballot measure number that is assigned, um, but it will be, I'm told it will be next week. Um, and and therefore, there will be only one measure on the November ballot for preschool. And and what, which measure is it? They were, uh, it's well, a, they had some universal. Uh, well, they had some commonalities. There also were right. some. It's essentially the county measure. Okay. Um, great. Um, so, I'd like to just capture that um, in the in the uh, board discussion that that's what we're, since we don't have a, a number yet, nor do we have the language. Um, thank you, Director, Director Moore. Any further discussion on this resolution? Um, yeah, Chair Larry, yeah, no, I appreciate um, the comments um, from both Director Brim Edwards and, and um, Director Constam. I think it's a it's a good topic for the Intergovernmental Committee to discuss um, in terms of of, of criteria um, and 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 what what is a board we, we we should be looking for in terms of this and 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 I also agree on the timing. You know, I, I think unfortunately sometimes things do come up last minute. This I, I think Director Moore would agree that that we would have loved to, you know, have 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 known about this and had a little bit more time. I, I also personally think it's an incredibly important issue and. Um, you know, in this case, um, even though I, I would have rather had a little bit more time to see the resolution and discuss it, I, I think given the deadlines um, in terms of endorsement, I, I'm, um, I also think it's really important that we take a stand and, and, and talk about this. And, and I think this, this is the kind of thing that will have a, a really clear impact on our goals as a district um, and our student outcome focused goals. Um, and so that's why for me, um, it, it's a really important issue and one that I'm, I'm happy to throw my support behind. So. I actually had a, a question also for the superintendent. Um, I think uh, Superintendent Guerrero, you were on the county uh, task force or some of the early discussions around the preschool for all. And I'm wondering how you see the interplay between the early learning money that was in the Student Success Act and this, this piece. Same, different, complementary. I, I didn't have an opportunity to be a part of some of the early preschool for all task force meetings. 
uh, as I know a lot of our early education team was, the one thing that I think all stakeholders around the table, whether you're school district in Portland or uh, a community partner out there uh, also providing services uh, or interested in expanding services, uh, there, was, there was very broad consensus about the benefit of increasing that access, uh, coming to agreement around quality standards for that experience, and the value of the investment in, in, in encouraging kindergarten readiness. So uh, as a superintendent, I can't be anything but uh, supportive uh, of efforts to, to make sure that uh, every child has access and equity to high quality early education. Um, I'm thankful that, uh, that Student Success Act set aside uh, a priority in, in early learning. Um, uh, we know that even with those monies and our ability to deploy some level of Head Start seats, that there's still a much greater need uh, than even those funds can, um, you know, are helpful uh, in, in opening up access. So um, I, I, I'm supportive. I'm supportive of that investment sort of going into uh, early education, uh, knowing that many of those four-year-olds in most cases are going to be enrolling uh, in PPS. So, I think it is a complementary investment that that dedicated resource. All right. Any further discussion before we can move on to voting? Yeah. Just just one more thing. This this is going to be a huge step forward for children in Multnomah County, and uh, part of the measure is raising wages for the workers, uh, which they are notoriously poorly wa poorly paid. So it's it's a win on any number of fronts, and I'm glad you are in a position to endorse it. All right, the board will now vote on resolution uh, six one six five. Um, do I have? Um, I guess we've already moved and seconded, uh, so. We just need to vote. So this is a resolution in support of a ballot measure establishing universal preschool in Multnomah County. All in favor, please indicate by saying yes. 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 All opposed, please indicate by saying no. Are there any abstentions? I don't know if that was an abstention or just static. So we'll just go with that it was static. Resolution 6165 is approved by a vote of six to zero with student representative Shu voting. Yes. All right, thank you all. We'll turn now to our student and public comment. Before we begin, I would like to review our guidelines for comment. The board, of course, thanks um, the community for taking the time to attend the meeting and provide your perspectives. Public input informs our work, and we look forward to hearing your thoughts, reflections, and concerns. Our responsibility as a board is to actively listen. Board members and the superintendent will not respond to comments or questions during public comment but our board office will follow up on any board related issues raised during public testimony. We do request that any complaints about individual employees be directed to the superintendent's office as a personnel matter. If you have any additional materials or items you would like to provide to the board or superintendent, we ask that you email them to publiccommentpps.net. Please make sure when you begin your comment that you clearly state your name and spell your last name. You will have three minutes to speak and you will hear a sound after the three minutes, which means that it is time to conclude your comments. Ms. Bradshaw, do we have anyone signed up for student comment this evening? Yes, we'll start with Rio Briggs. Rio, are you there? Rio Briggs? All right, Ms. Bradshaw, I see Rio is here on uh, WebEx and is unmuted, but I, I'm not hearing them. Um, do we? Let's see if we can get them connected somehow. Um, while we're doing that, uh, can we move on to uh, uh, another student who was here to comment? Yes, we don't have another student, but we do have um, two members of the public. Um, Deb Mayer. 
All right, Deb. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, just wanted to make sure I'm not too loud. <laughs> Um, so, Superintendent, members of the board, my name is Deb Mayer, M-A-Y-E-R. I'm an education advocate and a member of 5G Free Oregon. I'm here to address two issues, food security and families, uh, for families and the, use, the safe use of technology. PPS can deliver good food um, and lessons to students. I'm proposing that we we employ bus drivers and teaching assistants to literally deliver education to PPS students. Pardon me? I understand. I just made it so you don't have to do it. Number one, um, delivering meals to students who uh, would ordinarily be eating at school at um, it is, is the least that we can do. Feeding kids good food is the most effective intervention to improving learning. Currently, limited food delivery is available to some students. We're proposing that PPS make daily deliveries to every family that wants it. <laughs> Number two, you may recall that um, I advocated for Senate Bill 283 last year while running for PPS school board. I took a lot of heat for that, but um, the bill I brought attention to uh, uh, harmful health effects of Wi-Fi radiation and wireless devices um, on kids. The bill passed unanimously. The law uh, directed the Oregon Health Authority to produce a meta-analysis of studies on the topic. Um, that report uh, was due out in July, but it has been postponed. So what we want to do is um, to let you know a little bit about it today. And uh, we are in, um, so, some, so what are some of the health effects uh, that the Wi-Fi radiation has on kids? One, cancer, uh, changes in the DNA, damage to the immune system, infertility, addiction, dizziness, nausea, headaches, fatigue, eye problems, sleep disturbances, and memory problems. So since kids are being asked to spend much more time with Wi-Fi and screen devices, we want to inform parents now. We're proposing that students be provided with composition notebooks, lessons, and books um, so that they have an alternative to online learning. Um, then even students without internet can be able to complete assignments and communicate with teachers on a regular basis. There is something intrinsically satisfying about such a system. We're not asking that virtual education be terminated, only that everyone is aware of the risk and knows how to use the device, devices and Wi-Fi safely. To recap, we're asking that bus drivers and staffers deliver good food and education materials to all um, elementary students for health uh, for healthy and safe learning at home. We know of another school district doing this and it is working. For lack of a better analogy, we are in a better call Saul moment. We need to fix this. Uh, we can start by telling parents and families about the, the harmful effects of uh, Wi-Fi radiation and screen devices and we're, um, we're asking that you inform the family. So, um, for more information, for more information, you can visit us at uh, 5G Oregon Free and Parents Across America Oregon. All right, thank you for your testimony. Um, let's see if we can get Rio Briggs back. Um, Rio, are you there? Uh, Ms. Bradshaw, could you unmute them? Hi, Rio, are you there? All right, um, Ms. Bradshaw, we, you said we had another public commenter? Yes, we have Joshua LaCroix. Okay, let's hear from Joshua and then we'll try Rio one more time and, and hopefully they will be there then. Joshua, welcome. 
They're going to be one more time. All right, Joshua, there we go. Yes, hi there. Thank you for your time. My name is Joshua Lacroute, L-A-C-R-O-U-T-E, and I am talking about equity and technology for the upcoming school year. There we go. So uh, I have a few questions and comments about the readiness of every student uh, for online learning. And um, I, I know that you can't answer the questions, but these aren't rhetorical. So at some point, I do hope that I do get a response for, for these. Do you know if every student in PPS has access to a computer and the internet? Did you conduct a phone or paper mail survey? Some families don't have internet access, so sending an email or having the survey online for others uh, would be difficult to say the least. In short, what I'm asking, is every student ready? Because of COVID-19 and the need for online schooling, has PPS increased the technology budget by reallocating funds from other areas so your department can fill the demand and be successful? What added techno technology services are going to be given to children with physical, intellectual, and or emotional challenges? This goes for IEP 504s, uh, English as a second language. Uh, will one-on-one -on -one teaching for children that do need actual physical presence, will that be available? Will those educators be tested for COVID and will the student and family be tested for, for COVID to assure safety. Also, I'm looking uh, to find out the status of the student success funding to support tutors for BIPOC students. So I hope that that would be addressed very soon. I'm presuming that all fall sports practices and games have been canceled. So how were the funds for the athletic departments used to bolster and enhance ac academics? Uh, there was a speaker at the last board meeting that mentioned that schedules, particularly for high school students, were made so they could help young, their younger siblings on their schoolwork. My question is why? Some would retort, well, it takes a village to help raise a child. But older siblings should not, I repeat, not be burdened with teaching a younger sibling. It diminishes the older sibling's time to concentrate on their own education, period. Also, earlier this week, I read an email from PPS that there were going to be home classroom kits that were going to be available. Quote, the home classroom kits will be sold directly to families and who, uh, who have financial resources, while PPS is identifying additional resources to cover the costs for families who are not able to afford them. Why is public education suddenly a pay to play system, even if you're gifting it to another family? These kits should be free to any and all students, full stop. A lot has been mentioned about student equity, but the example above and the allocation of funds in the community really show the opposite at times. BIPOC and special education students are still not receiving everything that they need to. They are receiving less funds and op opportunities. This is your opportunity to show how e equitable you can be, and it needs to happen now. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to try to connect with Rio one more time. I hope you're there. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, so, Ms. Bradshaw, would you unmute Rio and we'll see if they are ready to speak. Hello, um, this is Rio's mother. She got stage fright, so we will have her write her concerns and email them to you. Totally understandable. It's um, really hard to speak in front of people for many folks and especially uh, online can be challenging and then in this environment with so many um, adults. So, Rio, thank you for your passion and your willingness to to want to speak. And I really look forward to your comments that you'll share with us in writing. So, thank you. But again, thanks to everyone who spoke tonight. Um, it, it takes a lot to be willing to sign up and to care. Um, 
know that you can connect with our board manager or with MPAL if you have something specifically you want to follow up with the board office. All right, Nathaniel, would you like to provide us with your report this evening? Uh, yes, I would. Thank you. Um, just one quick note. I've had fire alarms going off randomly, so sorry if that happens. Um, anyway, um, I really don't have much to report on um, today. I imagine that by next meeting, at which time, of course, school will be back in session, these reports will be significantly more substantive. Uh, for now, I'd just like to note that the DSC and I are currently working on the DSC and Student Representative po Board Policy 1.20.012P, and that um, we are currently in the process of onboarding new members in that regard. Uh, right. um, well, um, I think that's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Nathaniel. Um, we turn now to Superintendent Guerrero. Um, what would you like to share with us tonight, Superintendent? I echo, I can get a little anxious speaking to a large group of adults sometimes. Uh, good evening, directors, uh, staff, colleagues, uh, and good evening to everyone who's tuned in and, and watching on our live stream. Uh, as you know, tonight's meeting agenda takes up a little less of a page than than usual, uh, with the major focus being on the start of the school year plan. So. My report this evening really is mainly going to serve as an introduction to this evening's staff presentation, which uh, we hope will provide directors and the broader community an update on our plans for students. Uh, and also as a message uh, for the broader community, uh, particularly during this fluid and dynamic reality and constraints under which uh, we're attempting to operate. So by the time the board comes together again for a regular meeting, uh, the 2021 school year will have begun. Uh, everyone across our district, uh, teachers, administrators, central office staff, uh, they're continuing to prepare for what we're referring to as our soft start next Wednesday. Um, next slide, please. This school year will begin differently, of course. Uh, it won't begin the way we would all prefer. Uh, with open doors and uh, excited students, uh, full classrooms, uh, but we are doing, we are working to make, to do our best to make a successful launch, uh, a launch that's engaging and supportive uh, of a learning experience for our students as, as we can make. And uh, next slide, we know that uh, part of, uh, of making sure that learning experience uh, exists for our students is that we pay careful attention to those are questions of access and equity they were brought up earlier and that supports are, are made available. You're going to hear from the details of a growing list of uh, supports uh, that will continue to be messaged uh, to families. There's many challenges that have been brought on by this pandemic. Uh, we recognize, especially for students and families of color who have been uh, disproportionately impact, uh, impacted. Uh, and the reason why we're spending some deliberate time and energy uh, so that we're, we can be as helpful as we can be uh, in as many ways possible. We're very thankful of the focus groups, particularly from many of our families and communities of color uh, who, who have lent inputs. The soft start that I mentioned, uh, because of that concern for our students' well-being, will be focused on our educators building those connections with our students. As you know, these are new classes. Uh, they hadn't been together before. Uh, which is a bit different from the springtime when campus is closed. Uh, so there'll be uh, more attention to orienting our students and families. Uh, we are dedicating topics for professional development with our educators who are coming back this week uh, in, in helping them uh, with guidance and giving them opportunities to exchange ideas with one another regarding how to really welcome and, and meet our new students, how to engage with them academically and virtually how to get comfortable with those digital resources and the platform that we'll be relying on. Um, but I will reiterate, uh, many plans are under, underway for providing more support services to students and families than ever before. Uh, we've certainly ramped up our social emotional supports. Uh, you'll hear a bit later uh, how we're uh, partnering with our culture specific partners to provide uh, some deeper levels of family engagement to promote that student learning and support. Uh, with a focus on reducing the institutional barriers for families of color 
uh, and advocate for their needs. Uh, the partners are, or will also be providing some important wraparound services, which include academic tutoring, extended learning, enrichment, and programming uh, to provide that cultural identity development that matters now, especially, particularly during racial uprising uh, that, that, we're, that we're feeling. Um, and a lot of this is possible, it's important to underline and appreciate, is our student investment uh, account resources at work. That includes 55 additional social workers and counselors that I can't think of a better time uh, for them to come aboard. I think we've, we're down to the last handful uh, of openings. So we're really appreciative to HR and our school leaders uh, and our student support services office uh, for identifying those professionals uh, to start connecting with our kids. Uh, we've also, we're also staying close with our, our our local partners, including Multnomah County, uh, to make sure that we're collaborating and doing everything possible to connect with families uh, and services that may be available to them, including with housing assistance and medical care. Uh, we're continuing to think about the nutrition of our students. Over 1.2 million meals uh, have been served since we closed school buildings. I feel like we need a sign outside uh, the DESC maybe. Uh, we're gonna resume meal distributions at exponentially more sites uh, than we've done over the last five months. Uh, thank you to our nutrition service workers who have proved to be very essential. Um, and regarding the question of, you know, have we shifted significant resources? Absolutely, particularly millions in ensuring technology access and equity has taken place uh, to make sure folks know what to do with that hardware and that connectivity. Uh, we've stood up a technology help desk for families to get questions answered, they can dial in uh, and get acquainted with the learning platforms and, and, and get assistance with, with uh, how to use it uh, effectively so that our students uh, are properly set up and comfortable. Um, the help desk, uh, like the virtual orientation content we're publishing this week, uh, is accessible in all PPS supported languages. Uh, so we welcome any additional feedback and input as that help desk uh, comes online for, for our parents. So. Just a few mentions, uh, honorable mentions, on a, on a growing full list of supports being made available and uh, will continue to be advertised at the school level as well. Uh, we'll also be describing that array of services at pps.net uh, by the end of the week. Looking ahead, um, next slide, I know that for all the plans uh, that we've made, there's still many more questions. We have them, I know our families have them. Uh, we will get to some of your questions uh, this evening in just a few moments. Uh, we may not have every answer. This is an iterative process. Uh, Friday evening, we were coming to conclusion in a few areas. So uh, we're more prepared uh, today now to talk about specific schedules, for instance, uh, which I know everybody's anxious to hear more details about. Uh, but this is an iterative process. Uh, we are making adjustments, uh, particularly after uh, working and hearing uh, from our school leaders, our educators, and, and certainly we'll continue to make adjustments uh, as we hear from students and families as the school year gets underway. Uh, so we understand that, uh, and many of these questions are the same ones that other districts are contending with, uh, both across the state and across the country as we connect with our colleagues. Uh, they're contending with these same challenges. Uh, you see a variety of responses and approaches, and frankly, uh, a variety of impact uh, on those decisions. So uh, we have further work to do to clarify plans in certain areas, uh, spoiler, uh, such as, you know, what is that uh, availability of child care gonna look like? What is the prospect of bringing in small groups of students to campuses for some specialized learning support? And what about athletics? So we're working continually on these almost daily, particularly with the Department of Education. We're thankful for their collaboration. Uh, we'll continue to be guided foremost, as we have been from the beginning, uh, by our highest priority, the health and wellness of our students and staff. So stay tuned for an update soon regarding some of these items. If you don't hear a lot of details there, it's because they're still very much uh, being deliberated. But as the first day of school year approaches, our family should know that we're, we are thinking of those next stages uh, of work uh, to implement. Uh, so for when students can be allowed in buildings, uh, whether that's in a hybrid cohort model uh, or we're planning for that eventual and much anticipated day when we can actually just open our doors to all students and staff at once. Uh, 
Uh, so we're also giving thought to what interventions, support opportunities and enrichments are best gonna address those learning gaps and social emotional impacts that this pandemic has wrought. We recognize that. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, this next month, uh, this school year, it won't be easy, uh, but we will do our best to remain focused on delivering on our educational mission as best we can. Uh, we're here to support our students, uh, to serve them. Uh, we will need everyone's support. Thank you, board, uh, and, and our broader city, uh, particularly uh, as we anticipate state budgets are going to get tighter uh, in the coming months and certainly in the new biennium. Uh, just at a time when our students and our families are going to need more from us. Uh, so we'll continue to be as strategic and efficient as we can be. Moving forward, next slide. So uh, things may not get easier soon, but they will continually get better. Uh, next week will be better than this week because we're going to see our students. Uh, we'll see their faces. Uh, we'll be better at delivering distance learning to students uh, because of what we learned this past spring. and. We, have, we will have had more time uh, to plan than we did last March when our educators had very little time to make the switch to online learning. So uh, one day, hopefully very soon, we'll be inviting our students back to, to seeing them in person face to face. So things are going to get better. Um, so I want to thank you for, for your patience. Uh, I'm very grateful uh, to our staff who have worked tirelessly to get us to this point. I'm grateful for the patience uh, shown by our families. Uh, we're all navigating something very unprecedented here uh, in our community. Uh, uh, we appreciate the partnership of our labor partners whose collaboration has been uh, essential, especially as plans get underway. Uh, we're, we're as focused as ever uh, to get through these challenges that we're facing. Uh, we may be virtual here at first, uh, but we are excited for learning to begin once again uh, in the coming week. Uh, so it's with these opening remarks and, and message to community, Chair Lowry, uh, staff's prepared to, to provide our next school opening update. Uh, we've switched it up. So now on the pitcher's mound, coordinating our district efforts is Dr. Russell Brown, uh, our Chief of System Performance. Uh, he'll have uh, supporting roles this evening uh, from Danny Ledesma, our Senior Advisor on Racial Equity, our Chief of Schools, Dr. Sean Bird, and additional staff who are all playing a critical role. Uh, and certainly everybody's here on screen to take any questions. Uh, we'll do our best to answer as best we can uh, to provide those details. Uh, we're excited about the learning experience ahead uh, that our students and our families can expect. And, and, and we're excited to share some of those plans with you this evening. Let's go for it. All right, let's go for it. So uh, with your permission, Chair Lowry, I think Dr. Russell Brown is ready to kick us off. Good evening. Um, don't wait for the uh, presentation to be pulled up, please. Perfect. And if we could go to the, the next slide. So uh, good evening, members of the board, uh, Sup Superintendent Guerrero and members of our larger community that are watching this evening. Um, pleased to have this opportunity to provide an update to the board. Um, always like it when the, the superintendent steals uh, the majority of what I'm getting ready to say. <laughs> it makes it a little easier for me. Uh, it is an ever-evolving evolving environment, and we're uh, working to, to um, respond to it as quickly uh, and as iteratively as possible to improve the experiences uh, for our students. Um, Throughout our work in, in terms of our response to COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we've consistently centered on our, our theory of action and our planning. And I'm just going to reiterate that. If, if we braid uh, racial equity and social justice strategies into our instructional core, work with our students, teachers, and content, and build our organizational culture and capacity to create a strong foundation to support every student, then we will reimagine Portland Public Schools to ensure every student, especially our black and native students, who experience the greatest barriers realize the vision of the graduate portrait. And we will continue to, uh, to center our black and native students as we move forward throughout this academic year and as we iterate to, to continue to improve services for our students. In our last update, we uh, provided an overview of kindergarten registration, our expectations for our, our young learners. Uh, we provided demonstrations of the learning environment, Seesaw and, and Canvas, so that folks would have 
a, a sense of what uh, it would be like for students to be in those environments. We provided a, a brief overview of scheduling and uh, a brief overview of planned engagement for our students. Today's presentation, we're, we're going to switch it up a little bit to, to borrow from the superintendent's baseball analogy. Um, and, and we're going to provide uh, a deeper look at schedules and you know, what the day in the life of a student look like uh, at, at the elementary, middle, and high school level. And also then to um, what what does engagement and support look like? And, and again, from a student level, uh, in, in support of, of our students who have additional needs. We're also going to switch up the format a little. Uh, so tonight we'll start with Dr. Bird. Dr. Bird is going to give a deeper dive into schedules. And then we'll break and have a question and answer session uh, connected to, to schedules. And then after that, then we'll, we'll pivot. And uh, Danny Ledesma will come and speak about engagement and support. And we'll have a, a Q&A session after that as well. And then we'll move uh, on to, to closing. So with, with no further ado, uh, if we could go to the next slide, and then I will hand off to, to Dr. Burke. All right. Good evening, everyone. To continue the baseball analogy, I guess this is the first inning of the presentation. So if you could switch to the next slide. And we're going to talk about uh, schedules today. And before I start, I just want to remind everyone uh, that's excuse me, watching that we have uh, two terms that we use a lot that not everybody is familiar with. So asynchronous and synchronous, those are uh, terms that you'll hear and you'll see in writing. Uh, synchronous, you can just think of as that as, uh, as live interaction with a teacher uh, or uh, some interaction through, through technology, through text messaging, uh, video conferencing, et cetera. And asynchronous is work that students will do uh, sometimes on their own, sometimes it's independent work, such as uh, reading a book, writing in a journal. Sometimes it's watching uh, videos online, such as Khan Academy, uh, to help with math, some, some other kinds of apps that we have that students will use. So just want to uh, remind you of those terms as we go through the schedule. Next slide. So we have uh, taken feedback since last we were here. You can flip to the next slide. There you go. Thank you. And I just want to just remind us, oh, we'll go back one, sorry. That there are things that we were uh, firm about, and then there are things that we've given our building leaders flexibility of. So there are certain things that we required, such as uh, uh, teachers had to have office hours. There have to be supports in place for students so that uh, that they can access the technology. So we'll talk more about that in a bit. And there uh, there has to be um, uh, some element of, of family engagement and then time for teachers to give feedback to students. What what is flexible is uh, the start and end time. So we've heard from families that. You know, we already arranged childcare. Uh, we have elementary children, so we'd like to start at the same time that we start during the regular school year. So we allow that flexibility to our uh, building leaders. And then we've also told our building leaders that you, we've, uh, you know, here's the box. You need to fit these components in the box. But how you arrange uh, math and language arts, what time of the day that is, that's up to you as a as a building leader. But your school needs to be consistent. So if your teachers are going to, if you say that you're going to have um, second graders are going to have language arts in the morning, then across your school, you need to have second graders have language arts. So it can't be individual uh, teacher decisions about the structure of that. Um, and then uh, a reminder that we'll be taking attendance, and I'll talk about how that happens uh, in a little, in a, just a bit. Next slide. So today I want to take you through uh, a couple, a few schedules for each grade level, and I want to um, uh, introduce you to a second grader at Harrison Park, a fictional second grader named Maya. And so Maya is a second grade student and she, uh, if she goes to Harrison Park, she is going to start her day. Uh, we'll just say for uh, illustrative purposes at 9.15 in the morning where she'll uh, start preparing for the day. She'll have, they'll have their, get their things ready to go, have their breakfast and be ready to uh, set up at 9.30 for their social emotional lesson. So, in these slides, you see that green highlights. Those mean that that is synchronous instruction. So that's the teacher is live and uh, and delivering instruction. So the teacher will deliver a social emotional lesson, a morning meeting, from 9:30 to 10, and then students will start working on their uh, language arts and social studies lessons. Now the, here is where uh, there's some differentiation because we know it's important that students are, especially young students, are not online all day long, and so we want to be very clear that there are opportunities. That students will work independently, and then there are opportunities that students will uh, be with the teacher depending on their needs. In Maya's case, Maya has a specific learning disability, so she's she's still striving to read on grade level. So at 10:30, she's going to be working uh, 
on some, while the rest of the class is working on independent reading and writing tasks, she's gonna be working with a special education teacher online. So she'll actually be online some additional time to get some additional help. And then she'll join the rest of the class at 11 o'clock to do a small group for uh, language arts. Then 11.25, they'll have another break and they'll do some independent work. Uh, in this case, they're gonna be doing their uh, journal writing for uh, their independent reading and journal writing. Then there's going to be a break from the computer completely and they're going to have lunch and a, a short uh, recess time before they dive back in the afternoon to some um, independent math tests. In this case, uh, Maya is actually going to be online. She's going to work on Dreambox, which is one of our of the apps that we have. So she's going to go online and do that work uh, independently um, and, and then uh, move into some other uh, work. Two o'clock, she's going to have her math small group, so she'll be back online with her uh, with her, the rest of her class. And then at 2.20 is when we have time for independent math tests. But in this case, Maya's mom is um, working and she's not able to be, to uh, you know sit with Maya at the, exactly 2.20 to do her independent math test. That's fine. They're actually decided as a family that she's gonna do her math work at six o'clock this evening. That's why we have time built into the schedule that's synchronous and then we have some time that's asynchronous. So families have flexibility in the asynchronous time to do work at their own pace. We do know that some older siblings will be will be uh, watching after their younger siblings as their parents are working, or uh, they just have parents at home that are working and uh, trying to manage a, a lot of things. So we want to have built in flexibility for for families. You'll notice on this schedule that there's time built in for library. There's also time built in for PE, and uh, so every uh, elementary school student will have those uh, specials classes as we call them. So arts, uh, PE. And um, and time in the with the library media specialist. So that is uh, uh, that's how Maya's Monday and Friday would look, and we could go across, and you you would see that uh, she would have different opportunities to do that. So next schedule. Then we're going to move to middle school, and we're going to have I want you to meet Kyrie, who's a seventh grader at Beaumont. Uh, Kyrie is uh, going to be on Monday. He's going to start school also at nine thirty. Uh, he's going to uh, have language arts. Uh, in a live, in a synchronous class, uh, that's his first period class. So in the morning from 9.30 to 12.15, Kyrie is gonna be engaged with his teachers. He's gonna follow his his schedule, uh, the first three periods of his schedule. So in, in his case, it's language arts, PE and math. Then he's gonna have lunch and have a little break from the computer. And while he's in those classes in the morning, language arts and math particularly, he's going to have some opportunities to not just have the teacher talking to him, but the teacher is also going to break them uh, the class into small groups, collaborative groups online, so they'll be able to collaborate with one another. Because we also know it's important, especially for middle school kids, to to be able to uh, talk to their peers, to collaborate with each other. We don't want this to be an isolating event for them. We know that uh, you know social emotional uh, wellness is important, and that includes collaboration for students. After lunch, uh, Kyrie will go to advisory. His middle school has advisory, uh, and then. The afternoon he'll spend on applied learning tasks. Now that doesn't mean he won't have access to a teacher. He uh, may very well need to check in uh, with the teacher uh, or he, the teachers that have assigned him work in the morning. He may get stuck and need to uh, need to have access to some staff member. That will be possible in the afternoon. So it's not that he's done at 145. But again, Kyrie has to look after his younger siblings. So he can't necessarily get all of his work done between the hours of 145 four so he'll work on some of that uh later in the evening and, and that's that's fine too and tuesday Kyrie will continue his schedule he'll go to choir for this so is his fourth period class uh then he'll go to social studies fifth period he'll go to science during sixth period have a lunch break uh he'll be doing uh he's in a school that has actually a seven period day so at 145 while schools that have six period day will be doing applied learning he'll actually be in his seventh period class which is a spanish class and then he'll have uh, some time for applied learning. Now, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday uh, look, will look different for uh, every student. So you'll see there that it's all highlighted green, but that's uh, that's based on the teacher discretion. So in Kyrie's case, he's doing really well in language arts. He um, did well with his, uh, his, uh, his applied learning activity that he turned into his teacher. So he's gonna, um, he will have an opportunity to drop into office hours if he needs to, but if not, he'll just continue working on his assignments. But his math teacher would actually like to see him in a small group. So he'll be actually at 1130, he'll be logging on the computer to see his math teacher with some other students who are um, trying to accelerate in math and there are um, 
they are trying to uh, go into algebra by eighth grade. So he's going to be working on some uh, on some advanced math problems. This, and so the same thing will be true on Thursday. Friday, middle school students will have the opportunity to see all of their teachers if they need to. Otherwise, they'll continue working on their on their um, applied learning activities. Um, next slide. Now I want you to meet Marcos, who's a 10th grader at Roosevelt High School, a rough rider. He is going to be engaging in um, uh, in the morning applied learning from eight to nine. And this is um, specifically laid out here. Teachers will generally be in professional development or they'll have uh, time to meet with students. Now, um, uh, Marcos, is he plays in the band and he's going to have band first semester. You can see there he has a third period, but he really wants to make sure, his band director really wants to make sure that he is uh, keeping up with his, practicing his music and uh, making sure that he's, he's uh, keeping up his skills. So we're gonna he's gonna have a chance to meet with his band director uh, later, besides his class, he's going to have a chance to meet with his band director later in the week, and that'll be throughout the year. So let's just go with his Monday schedule. He's going to have first period Spanish, uh, third and fourth period. Or, I'm sorry, first period Spanish, three, four. And second period, he'll have English. And these blocks for high school students are a little bit longer. They're 75 minutes than middle school students. Then there'll be a lunch break. Everybody will go to lunch. Third and fourth period, third period is band. And fourth period is algebra. So those on Monday, that will be an asynchronous day. So he will either be working on uh, practicing his his trumpet uh, by himself, or he will um, maybe he'll do some uh, small group instruction with his band director. If you know, he might have sectional rehearsals on uh, on his asynchronous day. Um, and algebra, same thing. He may uh, do his applied learning, or he may uh, work in small groups if the teacher requires that. In the afternoon, he's going to have a break from 3.15 to 3.45 to, to do whatever he needs to do, uh, you know, catch his breath from the day. And then he's going to have his club meeting from 3.30 to 4.30. So we know it's very important for our, our secondary students to be able to, again, connect with their peers. And we want to make sure that we are running clubs and activities that we would normally run. So Marcos will, is, is, uh, is in a club. And then... The next day, Tuesday, he will have band live, so he may have practiced his trumpet on uh, on by himself on and or in sectionals on Monday. Tuesday is going to be with the full band, and then fourth period, he's going to have his algebra class live. So whatever he was working on yesterday, he'll be able to uh, practice that. And then his first and second period will then be uh, will then be asynchronous. And in Marcos' case, uh, Spanish, uh, he's uh, going to be working. He took a quiz on Monday and he didn't do so well. He uh, he actually made a D on that quiz, so he's going to be working with his Spanish teacher in a small group for about 20 minutes, just to kind of remediate that, and so that he can uh, improve for the next time and maybe do some uh, makeup work so that he, he can improve his grade. On Wednesday, uh, Marcos will actually have the opportunity to see all of his teachers uh, for a period of time. Uh, there, if then again, that's just like the middle school; it's a teacher discretion uh, if they need to pull him. So uh, if he needs to do some. A more uh, uh, intense work in Spanish or English or any of his classes that he can uh, do that with his teacher. Uh, and then we have uh, from 12.35 to 1.50, he's going to have office hours for any of his, he'd be able to drop in by appointment to see his teachers uh, until uh, 1.45. Afternoon, he'll have applied learning. And then at 3.30, he's going to have band practice again because uh, Marcos is in symphonic band. We, he really wants to uh, you know, prepare for when we go back to school, when we ha have, are able to have a concert. And his band is actually going to practice every Wednesday at this time. So teachers that would normally be in a, in a um, PLC, the band teacher uh, will have some opportunity. It may not be at this time throughout at the day, but they'll have some opportunity to work with those um, groups of students in ensemble groups and in, uh, in other um, uh, classes. Marcos also, he uh, if he were taking, for example, if he were taking an AP uh, class, he could also uh, use some time either in the morning at eight o'clock in the morning to do some modules with his AP teacher in the semester that he's not in the class to prepare for the AP exam. Beginning September 1st, the College Board is releasing a bunch of video modules for all the AP courses so that we, because so many schools are going to this uh, schedule. So there'll be additional practice that he'll have access to a teacher to help him through that. You can also do those on your own. So depending on what he needed to do. And then Thursday and Friday, we'll repeat that schedule uh, that we did on Monday and Tuesday. So there's some continuity of instruction. Next slide. And I want to introduce you to 
Tasha. She's my last friend tonight. She's a junior at Cleveland High School, and she is really dedicated to the IB program. She has really uh, decided to go for it and go for the full IB diploma. So we admire her, uh, her dedication to her studies. So she is uh, on a very, uh, uh, she's on a, a year long schedule, eight period schedule, but there's some modifications to the schedule. So again, from eight to nine, some of her teachers may decide to have some uh, groups for IB, uh, extra IB practice, or she may have some other, uh, she, she's in choir, so she may uh, have some time to work with teachers. But she's gonna have her first period class uh, similar. Uh, she's gonna have her IB English class, it's gonna be live, and then she'll have biology second period live. And then she'll have lunch, just like the four by four schedule. And then third and fourth period, very similar to the other schedule. She's going to acquire, so she's going to be practicing for her solo that she's preparing for. And then she's going to have uh, IB math uh, in the afternoon. She's also very actively involved, so she's going to have a club meeting in the afternoon. She'll have a chance to do that. The next day, uh, she'll go to periods five and six. So she's going to have history. And then six periods, she's going to have an IB boost class. Because even as dedicated as Natasha is, we know that these are, uh, it's challenging to keep up with that many academic classes. So we want to give her an opportunity to be in a, an IB Boost class, which is, uh, you can think of it as sort of a uh, uh, support class for IB students. So she can work on a variety of, of topics in that class to prepare for those exams uh, so that she can score well and get her college credit. Seventh period, she has digital media. So that's an elective that she chose. Uh, and that's going to be, uh, in this case, her teacher is going to call them together for 30 minutes to do some uh, group work. Uh, they're working on a project, so her group will get together on the platform that we have and work on that. In the eighth period, she has study hall because, again, looking look at her schedule, she's got a pretty tough load there. So we want to make sure she has opportunities to uh, have some time to, um, to make sure she's keeping up with everything and has time to check in with teachers if she needs to. On Wednesday, she'll actually see all eight of her teachers if she needs to. So she'll have, there's a short period of time that the teachers can call kids together uh, to drop in, or they can have some structured time with teachers. Again, just like in the afternoon, uh, in the four by four schedule, she'll have opportunity for office hours. She'll have some time to work on her projects from Monday and Tuesday. She's got that history uh, project that's, that's coming due. So she'll spend some time on the applied learning. And then in the afternoon, <clears throat> she too is uh, an accomplished musician, so she'll be practicing with her choir uh, in the afternoon uh, um, on Wednesdays. Then Thursday and Friday, we will uh, repeat that all over again. So that is uh, a view, an overview of schedules. Uh, thanks for meeting. Chair, it's, Char it's, Char it's Chair Lowry. Yeah. I just wanted to say that it looks like on Thursday, they it's the sort of the reverse they have third and fourth period and then first and second and it looks like there's a typo it says period three and two but i think it should be three and four. Oh, you are right. clear on that yes you are correct i'm sorry oh, oh yeah. no i just i yeah. i have a very interested cleveland student who's going to ask me yeah. lots of questions after this meeting so i want to make sure i tell her the correct answers yeah that's right so we did want to um yes yeah, so they will have uh their classes will all be in the morning that are live and then the afternoons will be uh asynchronous now and then I just want to say this: uh, in all of these schedules, the times, you know, will follow the, the schedule of the school. And principals are now preparing to communicate out to their communities their exact um, schedules. I know they're building, or they're they're uh, populating their master schedules, so they will um, they'll be sending those out shortly. I know some schools have started to do through the registration process. And that uh, is a conclusion of the day in the life of Maya, Kyrie, Marcos, and Natasha, and many other people just like them. And we'll take your questions now. All right, let's open it up to board members for questions. Um, I'm not going to do alphabetical order this time. We'll just see. Uh, I would ask that you only ask one question and then allow for another board member to ask a question and then we'll come back to you. So um, does anybody have any questions to get us started? Chief Bird, this is Director Constam. Um, I guess my first question is, um, do, do you expect that office hours take the place of flex? Is that the primary time when students will be able to individually um, have have one on one time with their high school teachers? There are actually so, several opportunities. That is one of the times they can have one on one time, but they're also in the in the uh, asynchronous times. Uh, teachers could just have uh, they could say, hey, we're going to have office hours this time while you're working on your applied learning. 
those of you who need to see me can come here. But yeah, this, so there's multiple opportunities for kids to do that, but that's the specified time in the schedule that we asked. Uh, we asked that there's a specified office hour time. And this is a good chunk of time at that period. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question about um, the primary grades. If we've anticipated um, a reset time or, I mean, what if we're a month into it? What do we do when we're 30 days into this schedule and we're finding it's not working for families? Do we have a plan B for those families? So thank you, uh, Director DePass. So we are gonna be monitoring um, the schedule and we'll monitor the engagement of students and uh, how individual school principals will be responsible for monitoring um, how uh, it's working for families. We do have some supports that Danny's gonna talk about in a few minutes that are sort of built in to help people you know, with technology with, uh, and we've done some front end work with our particular our CSI schools with our Summer Connections Academy where we've done orientation with our families. And that is continuing with other schools. We have, a, that's the template that we've used, but where they've uh, sat down with the family and said, you know, this is how it works. I do want to also stress that the asynchronous time is not locked in. You know, we're not going to be calling, a, um, we're not going to be calling uh, Maya's house at uh, 1230 to make sure she's working on her asynchronous math lesson. You know, she, that is up to her family to figure that out, how that works best for them. What is uh, fixed and it may not be those exact times you just saw on the schedule, but teachers will have a routine that we're gonna be online every morning at nine, nine for example, for, for our morning meeting at SEL. So those log on times will be fixed, but we also want to be sensitive that, uh, you know, young children cannot uh, sit, even big children like me cannot sit for hours on end in front of a computer. So we just want to be uh, sensitive to that. So there, you'll see that's why the breaks are sort of built into the schedule like that. Thank you. But we will monitor and make adjustments as we need to. Yeah, to answer your question, I don't think I actually said that, but yes, we will make adjustments. I have a question about printing. Um, so I, I think uh, this, you know, we've got, this will increase, I think, uh, the need for printing. A lot of families don't have a printer, mm -hmm. their computer. Uh, schools notoriously don't have enough budget for paper. Uh, a lot of the times, um, and so parents and teachers and whoever you know throws money at it. Um, how can we? How are we going to deal with this in the fall so that it's that printing need is is fully funded and fully met yep. in terms of getting printed materials out to families and students? Sure. So we are, do have a we're develop. It's pretty much developed, but we're putting the final touches on the development of a process for schools to be able to uh, print things at the at the school. So if te there, we do know there are a number of uh, teachers that may have the desire to come in and teach from their classrooms, so they'll have access to copy machine, those kind of things that they can print. We can use our bus service to deliver things to um, families. Uh, that the those our plans are being uh, finalized. We also have a central. Uh, warehouse uh, central print shop that we can print things at uh, and we have a system to uh, you know uh, just as you would do if you, you were in school if a school wants to send a print job they send it there's a deadline and it goes out through the we would deliver it in this case through bus service uh, many of our uh, uh, most of the assignments however that kids will do will be actually completed online and there are um, there are uh, mechanisms in the platform to submit your work you can do teachers can create assessments online uh, that are, uh, you know, multiple choice kind of assessments in Canvas, for example, that are actually even auto graded. Um, so there, so a lot of that stuff will be handled online. It could be randomized to make sure that students are not getting the exact same uh, quiz and, you know, for obvious reasons. But um, there will be uh, opportunities for most of the work to be submitted will be submitted via uh, the technology platform. But we do know there'll still be a need for certain things will come up and we have uh, plans for uh, being able to print those those things and uh, disperse them uh, through our uh, transportation system. Can I ask a question about the, um, this is Rita, um, about the uh, applied learning uh, huh. at 8 a.m. at the high school level? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So from eight to nine, that will be, that's time where teachers are either in PLCs or PD or, um, as I mentioned, uh, we wanted to build some more flexibility into our high school schedule so that those students who are involved in AP, AP or band or choir or those ensemble groups that may need to meet some of those teachers that 
you know, there is only one band director at a school. So a PLC of one is a bit challenging. So they could be released from that time to work with the band uh, on certain days. Other days they could meet with other band directors at other schools. But that, so there's flexibility in that eight to nine o'clock hour. Uh, and it's for uh, students to, they will do their own, they'll do their own uh, work. They'll be, you know, have projects to do throughout the year. It's also time for them to kind of get ready for their day and, uh, and get set for the, have breakfast, do all those things, and then um, join the class at nine o'clock. So are they, um, is that hour going to be potentially re required time for students? It's it's required. Yeah, it is a it's part of the day for students in that they'll be it's asynchronous time. So they'll be working on a project. They'll be uh, getting either they could be meeting with a small group of maybe they have a project in social studies. It's a group work and there's three people in the group. Those three students could meet together using our platform uh, to um, to collaborate or whatever. Or they could or they could just be getting you know they could be working on individual work at that time. Okay. But again, that's it doesn't have to be done between eight and nine. That's that is purposely flexible so that kids that can't do it at the time, maybe they'll do it at I mean, when I was in high school, I did my best work at 11 o'clock at night. That's not great. Yeah. but Maybe that's when they choose to do it. Ditto. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm just a little concerned that um, it it looks on paper like we're moving in the wrong direction um, for high school schedules. Um, I was hoping that we would be moving later, not earlier. Um, but if if this is intended to um, intended to be really flex time, it is. Yeah. Okay. The actual live class won't start until whatever time that that was on there. Yeah, it is a bit later for them. Okay. I I still I I'm just going to say this. Um, I'm still concerned that um, some schools and some teachers may end up requiring that students be functional at 8 a.m. And everything we know about physiology for adolescents says that that's problematic. So, so what, I can, what I can say with certainty is that no teacher will be requiring a student to log in because teachers will be engaged in PLCs or professional development. So there will be no, uh, there's no instruction that's delivered at 8 a.m. in the morning. Uh, unless it's arranged between, you know, like the band or the choir, you know, unless it's something like that. But that's usually happening in the afternoon. We built time in the afternoon for that schedule. So teachers will be uh, involved in PLCs. And so there will not be any, if a student chooses to get up and do their, their math homework at 8 o'clock, that's their choice. But there's no login time at 8 o'clock. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Is there a login time at any point? In yes. Time? Yes, for their for their classes that they, they have to follow that bell the bell schedule. They have, first period they have to show up to first period uh, in the so high school is the morning, uh, really, from nine to around twelve is is actually uh, they're in, engaged in a live class work. And when you say show up, does that what does that mean? They're on a video screen or they uh, have you know in the chat uh, logged in or what is that? Yeah, so thank you for that question. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, actually. So, uh, sync, uh, you know, the true, truest form of synchronous learning would be uh, if you were my teacher, director of my words, and you and this was your class, uh, you would see all of us, our bright and shining faces here, and you would uh, deliver instruction to us. Um, so that would that's the truest uh, form of synchronous learning. That's how we'll record attendance for that class period. Now, you notice that the kids are going to like two classes in the morning and then they have the afternoon asynchronous. So how will we know if they're participating in that? At some point in that day, in the day, they'll need to log on to Canvas and it doesn't have to be at you know two o'clock in the afternoon, but they'll have to log on at some point and do whatever task is required of them. And we can uh, we can detect that uh, login and then that counts as, uh, as our positive attendance for the, that student during the day. Now, will they, uh, so they should log in for their class and they should be just like, we are looking at each other now. They could uh, they could definitely participate uh, via chat, but they have to be logged in to do that. So um, there'll be a variety of ways that teachers can um, engage with students. So we have a variety of apps that uh, uh, Luis and uh, the OTL team have uh, procured through the which we call the digital backpack. So there's uh, sometimes in their applied learning time, they may be working on a lesson uh, for history uh, using Nearpod, which is a is a um, highly engaging. Um, app that students can, it's very interactive, it's video and there's check for understanding in there. 
So there, there are things that all of the apps that were chosen were chosen because they, uh, they sync up with Canvas. And so teachers can get assessment data about students uh, on a regular basis. So it's not always just, you know, the kind of what we think of as a normal test that we take in a class, but there's lots of uh, assessment, for informal assessment data teachers can get to make sure students are learning, which is how they'll decide that, uh, Julie, uh, the, that you know, um, to, I may need to see Andrew because Andrew is just, He's just not doing well in history. And I look at his Nearpod, he's really not logging in. He's staying on there for 35 seconds, I can tell that. So then I'm gonna tell Andrew, hey, I need you to come on small group day uh, and uh, and work with me so we can we can check that out. So there's, there's lots of different uh, kinds of checks and balances in the in these uh, in these plans so the teachers are able to respond to the needs of students. Can I just say as the parent of a high schooler, uh, this is great and I really, appreciate you know all sort of the flexibility for students but also that rigor and the a way for you know i was telling someone today that grades are a communication tool you know and so the, the goal is to help students and parents know where kids are um and so that having the that ability to look at all of that information and be able to respond and be able to say okay we need you in small group or like director de as you said like are we going to be able to be responsive and flexible you know these kinds of things allow teachers to see where students are and adjust and i think that's going to be really key so i thank you so much for the work you and your team have done on this chief bird all right are there any other questions before we move along to the next portion of our uh time together today uh, uh, one of, oh. go ahead director uh, I have one other question um and i realize uh this is an incredible undertaking uh, with not enough time and sometimes conflicting directives from the state. Um, we did have some families request uh, to see if we could do some evening instruction. Presumably these are parents who work during the day and would want to be there to support their child uh, for at least part of the instructional day. Um, can you talk about did you consider that um, incredible challenge to do that? Uh, yeah. It's hard, so, hard enough doing one schedule. Yeah, so, and we really, um, you know, uh, we really wanted to have uh, students have the most uh, routine as possible. Uh, so we wanted to kind of mirror the schedule for a couple of reasons. Also, because our, our teachers, we have to give them a predictable schedule to, to work as well. So um, the schedules uh, that we consider all, you know, daytime schedules, again, with flexibility built in so that if uh, their, um, you know, their parents can certainly check in on them and see what's happening, but uh, we'll have opportunities to, to review the kind of work that they're doing. These platforms are 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So anytime that a, a parent would like to uh, be able to see progress of their child, they can. But we um, won't have any instruction um, outside the regular uh, school day, except for what, um, you know, we already have with Portland, Portland Evening Scholars or, the, you know, those programs will still operate the way they are operating. The Multiple Pathways to Graduation programs, their schedules are, they are gonna be slightly different from the ones you saw here because they are unique uh, programs that are offering very unique, uh, you know, they, they're they are tailored to a unique uh, group of students. So those programs would, op would operate uh, a little differently than the regular high school program. So th these families would probably really appreciate the kind of technical assistance. Yep. So in the evening they can, with their student, log into Seesaw or Canvas um, and really see how their student's doing, what their student has been working on. Yep. And thank you. And communicate thank with the teacher. Yes, thank you for that. And we'll uh, develop some uh, so, uh, I, have a, I have two questions um, and they're totally different. Um, one is I have some people I work with who are taking time off from work from home in order to be able to help their K-5 students um, get online and, you know, make the transition um, that's going to be required. And um, obviously, a lot of people aren't going to be able to do that, whether if they're essential workers or they don't have that option to take um, time off, um, whatever the set of circumstances. How um, 
how would parents get help from the school district if they're in that situation? Like I am an essential worker, say I'm a yep. OHSU nurse and that's my shift. And so I can't be there. What, where do people go to raise their hand? Is that like at the school level? Is there a centralized? Um, yes. So director. Me to a learning pod or what? So that's coming up actually in uh, Daniela Desmond's presentation. She's going to be talking about the supports that we offer. So I will just say that there are uh, those are um, coming online as we, um, you know, the more and more, as the superintendent said earlier, are coming online as we are continue to develop those. But we do know that people have unique needs, and um, we our principals are sort of our frontline uh, advocates for those, and and they have reached out to us uh, about a variety of situations. So there are definitely. Um, um, alternative uh, solutions that we are working with. Uh, and so I'm gonna, that would be part of Danny's uh, presentation. And then we can come back and ask questions again after she. Okay, Let, let's go ahead and do that. Let's, um, it's 7.23, which means we've been here almost 90 minutes. So let's take a um, three minute stretch break. I'm gonna ask that everybody stand up, including you, Superintendent Guerrero, uh, just so that we stretch a little bit. It's good for our bodies, it's good for our brains. Thank you, Director Bailey, for following directions. Um, and then we'll come back at 726 with Danny Ledesma, and then we can ask more questions after that. All right, three minutes, go. At 26, Ms. Ledesma, are you here and ready? Uh, I am. I'm here and really ready. All right. <laughs> Ready and excited. Well, thank you everyone for your patience. I know that um, folks are anxiously awaiting hearing a little bit more about family supports. Um, so, uh, you know, as we heard from uh, Chief uh, Bird, uh, we know the power of the instructional core in the education of students. Uh, we know how critically important it is that we're focused on that instructional core. But we also know how important it is to ensure that the cultural, emotional, and basic needs of our students and families are met 
so that we can really make sure that we're ensuring that our students are, are succeeding. And as we all are aware, given the challenges of COVID, the economic fallout as a result of COVID, and the struggle for racial justice, our students and families are in need of quite a bit of set of supports in order to be able to thrive and realize their potential in these challenging times. So to that end, the superintendent charged a cross-department committee to scan our district and our community to document and to publish all of the student and family supports that are currently offered at schools. So the team was charged with publishing this menu of supports and interventions that were specifically aimed at making sure that our Black and Native students and students of color can successfully engage in learning and positive relationship building. Um, these supports, we were charged with making sure that they include a continuum of services that meet the needs of students and align with our tiered systems of support, uh, our vision, PPS reimagined, our emerging strategic plan, our work in racial equity and social justice, and culturally responsive and sustaining instructional practices. So the team has been um, considering uh, these supports while also trying to align um, school-based and external partner-provided supports, while also making sure that we're integrating the stakeholder input and feedback from the work that our Chief of Engagement, Jonathan uh, Garcia, has been uh, leading. And so uh, as a result of this, we have been, uh, char we have been really busy um, and we have categorized supports into five distinct types and you'll see a list of that. So we focused in on academic supports and these are supports that are focused on providing additional academic interventions to ensure that students are learning. They include supports such as academic tutoring, curriculum support, and even professional development for teachers. Uh, belonging and connection. These supports are focused on providing social and emotional support for students and include um, supports such as school-based school counselors, access to a social worker or a qualified mental health provider, group sessions, and mentoring and leadership development. Family supports and resources. These are supports that are focused on providing families with the connections, referrals, and resources to ensure that critical and basic needs are met. These include um, items such as food distribution, case management, wraparound services, and anti-poverty efforts. Enrichment and Extended Day, these supports are focused, focused on augmenting academics and structured and engaging activities to enhance and expand the learning of students outside of school hours. And these include activities like Chess for Success or virtual after school programs. Um, culturally specific supports are supports that are provided by a culturally specific provider. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about those. So um, our diverse committee, uh, which includes several departments, also several different types of leaders uh, throughout our district, scanned our district. We identified which schools these supports were provided. We worked with principals. We worked with principal supervisors to get an exhaustive catalog. Um, and so we are right now in the process of working in collaboration with our communications pro, uh, department um, and language access services department headed up by David Roy to create a catalog and I say catalog in, in parentheses, so that parents will know about services provided at their student's school and we'll also be sending a postcard to every family that's translated that directs them to, to this catalog. Um, and David's team not only is working on translating uh, the information so that it's, it's um, relevant to families and their, their home language, but also making sure that it's um, visually appealing, that it's easy to read and accessible, and that it's not just a giant uh, spreadsheet like I would like I would create. Um, so we are working in partnership. Uh, one of the things that um, we're really proud of is that this catalog of services not only represents uh, the work of our PPS, our, our talented and diverse PPS staff, but it also represents our community, our partners, our sister jurisdictions, their supports as well. Um, and we are really committed to continue to in ensure this collaboration and coordination and making sure that we're sharing information so that, so that parents and students know where resources are located and how to access them. So these supports are evolving. I wanna be really, be, be really careful about this to let you know that we are continuing to get guidance from ODE um, and our, we're continuing to work within our district to make sure that we're coordinated um, and that we're, uh, that, that we're, really maximizing the impact of the of these services. 
Um, the other thing that we are we are doing and that we're committed to do is to continue to evaluate and analyze any gaps in services so that we're able to really get in and provide needed supports. Um, uh, these supports will be cataloged by schools, but there is um, a tiering to these, right? So we have really prioritized our Native and Black students, our students of color, but we're also continuing to make sure that our CSI, our TSI, and our title schools have a range of services um, to really make sure that we're supporting our students and ensuring the success of our students in those school communities. So um, I wanna take you through some examples of students. So if you wouldn't mind advancing, uh, uh, Roseanne. Um, so Sean told you and introduced you to uh, some students, and I'd like to tell you a little bit more about those students. So um, you heard uh, Sean talk about Maya, who's a second grader at Harrison Park. Uh, Maya and her sister Kaya uh, attend uh, Harrison Park, and Kaya is the third grader at Harrison Park. And her family, who are, who are native they just moved to portland last year and they are they are trying to connect not only to services and to the schools but to the larger native community in portland um, and wanting to make sure that uh, they are really uh, ma making sure that their students are succeeding. And so um, they are at Harrison Park. Um, there are strong connections through the NAIA Family Centers, culturally specific family engagement services. Um, and as a student, both Maya and Kaya are excited to uh, participate in Harrison Park's student equity team. Uh, Maya's mom, as Sean mentioned, is working, but unfortunately her dad lost his job and they are they are worried about how they're going to be able to meet all of their, their all of their basic needs, including food. Um, and so Harrison Park is both a PPS nutrition site, which will be offering food services on set days, but it's also a food pantry site. So on days when nutrition services aren't available, uh, the family will be able to access uh, the the food pantry to be able to shop for um, to shop for food to get them through the weekend. Um, and through those times uh, when when they need additional um, food. Um, you know, Kaya is a third grader and she really likes school. She's learning uh, to, uh, she's learning about her peers and really likes that. But one of the things that uh, the principal and teachers have identified is that she's, she's struggling with reading. Um, and so uh, Harrison Park has uh, access to instructional specialists and it's also a Sun Community School where she'll be able to access additional academic supports to really, uh, to really round out and really get her on track for reading in third grade, which as you all know, is a really critical time. Um, we heard about Kyrie. Um, Kyrie is black and he is a, um, he's a seventh grader at Beaumont. And so he's right in that critical pre-adolescent to adolescent age. That's really important. And Kyrie has really struggled with connection. Um, during uh, COVID and also the summer's racial uprising. It has been really difficult for him. Um, he is not really looking forward to starting school again. And um, he especially, even though he's, he's doing well in English, as, as Sean talked about, he's really struggling with math and has some anxiety about math. So Beaumont is a Sun School site, as well as a Sun Youth Advocacy site and a Promise Neighborhood site. So both uh, youth, Sun Youth Advocacy and Promise Neighborhoods provide culturally specific supports and case management um, at the middle school level. But also this year, Black Parent Initiative will provide positive cultural identity development program in partnership with Beaumont. Um, and uh, we, th we think that Kyrie would be a really great student to participate. Uh, Beaumont also has a school counselor and a qualified mental health provider for the SES classroom. And they also have uh, really robust restorative justice practices um, to help with school climate. Um, academically, Beaumont has both a full-time instructional coach as well as a half-time math instructional specialist that Kyrie and his teachers will be able to access to support him through the school year. Um, Marcos, uh, we heard about Marcos at Roosevelt High School. And Marcos um, has two sisters. Uh, one of his sisters is Esperanza, and Esperanza attends uh, Roosevelt um, with him. And then he also has a sister, Luisa, who attends George Middle School. Um, and their family uh, identifies as Latino. And um, Marcos, before uh, coming to Roosevelt um, in eighth grade, when he was at George, was identified as an 
academic priority student. And so uh, Open School in partnership with George and Roosevelt uh, worked with Marcos um, and, and has uh, spent some time with him in his summer before he came to um, to uh, Roosevelt and then has been working with him. And he is doing well, as you heard, he's, uh, he's a really avid musician. And so uh, he's, he's doing a great job of balancing his academic and his, his uh, arts education uh, with the help of his open school advocate. Um, unfortunately, his sister Esperanza um, through uh, COVID um, and all of the virtual reality has really struggled um, with some online um, harassment. Um, she has um, really uh, sort of retreated um, from school and school activities um, and has really struggled to connect with her peers uh, because of the climate online. And so um, we're really excited that she can access Latino Network Escalera, an early Escalera program. Um, and at uh, Roosevelt, the Latino Network also has a Colegio de Padres. Um, and through this family engagement program, uh, they can really support uh, Esperanza's parents um, so that they can help uh, navigate some of the online parental controls for technology, um, as they can really uh, understand the technology that she's using and help uh, work with Esperanza to come up with a plan to make sure so that she's really um, she's really uh, protected in the online environment. Um, uh, Mark uh, Roosevelt is also a Sun Site school. Um, they also have an on-site community mental health provider uh, that is culturally specific a counselor and a social worker. And so this team of folks between uh, the staff at Latino Network, the Sunsite uh, lead agency, the community mental health provider, the, counsel and so the counselor and social worker are all working in alignment to make sure that she has access to services and support so that she can uh, come through this uh, online bullying experience um, better. Um, Louisa, uh, we heard about their uh, sister Louisa, who attends George Middle School, um, and uh, there is a, um, a food pantry site at George, and so family will also be able to access that um, when the PPS Nutrition site, which is at uh, Roosevelt, is not available. Um, the last student I wanted to talk to you about was Natasha at Cleveland. Um, and so we heard that Natasha is in uh, the IB program. She is um, very interested in school, um, but she, Natasha has quite a bit of anxiety about college and really wanting to, uh, is really struggling um, socially. And so um, at Cleveland, uh, there is not only a school counselor who can help her um, sort of work through some of her college plans and really support her um, in that way, there's also an on-site uh, based community mental health provider that she'll be able to access to help work through some of her anxiety issues. Um, so you heard a little bit about the set of services that are offered to our students that we talked about, their students and their families. Um, what we're hoping is that we will be able to provide a robust catalog so that families can look and identify their school, think about their students' needs and their families' needs, and be able to see where's, where what services are best suited for them. So in our catalog, we'll not only have uh, the location of where the services are, but we'll also try to have uh, uh, an easy easy to uh, access definition of what's going on at each of the schools. So uh, we're really excited about this. We're really, um, we're, we're in process um, and we've got it almost all nailed down, but we're really excited to be able to communicate this. And a lot of the work that we'll be doing, not only with our committee, but with um, our partners at Multnomah County, at 211 Info, um, our parents, our, uh, our engagement team at PPS is making sure that we're thinking critically about how we make sure that this information gets communicated across the district and throughout the district. Um, and so we're looking forward to coming back to you to, to talk to you about some of the lessons that we learn in ways that we can make sure that we're really improving not only on what's being offered uh, to make sure that we're meeting uh, needs, but also ways that we're, we're making sure that people can access it and communicate our, our plans. So I think I'll open it up for questions. Director Ben Edwards, did you get your question answered that you had uh, raised um, at the end of the last session? Uh, no, but I'll ask it. Um, Great. Can you hear me? 
Okay. Yes. Yeah. What's that? Because I'm clear. My microphone is off. Um, so I had some technology questions. Um, so earlier, um, when Dr. Bird was uh, talking, he talked about uh, you might in the morning class when it's the synchronistic um, opportunity when you have the classroom <laughs> that you'd have the screen of um, with all the tiles of the student photos and. From talking to teachers last spring, um, they said that generally the practice was um, students had their videos off. And I'm wondering um, what our policy is and if it's uh, there it sounds like there's a lot of benefits of having them on just the engagement level. Um, but also there's questions about when students have them on privacy related questions and what's in the background and whether people are taking screenshots. Um, just the perhaps the disparity of students um, environments. So I'm curious sort of what our general guidelines or policies are um, related sure. to that. Yeah, I'll, I'll turn it over to Sean. And I, I would also just say that Brenda Martinek and our Title IX uh, director have been working on digital citizenship, uh, where we want to sort of like not only talk about policies, but talk about like a culture online and sort of how do we ensure that we're really um, supporting students to be good digital digital citizens and, and to be really supportive of each other, you know, and create uh, cultures where it's free from uh, free from harassment for sure, but also uh, ways that uh, students can support each other and, and be aware of some of the issues. So Sean, I think also can answer. And so in addition to that, you notice if you look at uh, me or Jonathan Garcia, you can really, uh, our, our background is blurred. So that's a feature that uh, Zoom has. That's also a feature that Google, Google uh, Meet has just introduced. So uh, we're trying that out. Some of us are trying that out in the district. So there are um, ways that you can uh, minimize the background because we don't want um, children to feel, you know, embarrassed or, or whatever about, uh, um, you know, their background. So, so there's that. But is there a is there a policy that the district has around um, around turning the camera on or off? No, teachers, um, you know, t different teachers approach that different ways. But as as uh, Danny said. Um, we do have our, our digital citizenship lessons that we're teaching our students and also our teachers um, so that, you know, we have some uh, guidelines about how to deal with, um, just as you would in a classroom, how to deal with bullying, how to deal with uh, misbehavior of, of uh, students that are online. And um, so, you know, we, we will um, address those issues on a case by case basis. Uh, and, you know, there are uh, kids that, you know, they may not want to uh, show their face online, but they can certainly participate through the chat. So teachers can monitor student engagement in different ways. Uh, there are, uh, you know, there are instant polling uh, things on some of these uh, programs that you can use. So you can, kids ha will have a variety of ways to engage in the in the uh, platform. I, I would just add, I, I think that's right. I think for a lot of the reasons uh, you listed, uh, Director Brim Edwards, I don't think we want to have any hard and fast rules around camera on. I think we want to we want to focus on the responsible participation uh, uh, and, and afford our, our students some level of judgment. I had an opportunity to observe uh, arts classes uh, last week, and I had a chance to maybe visit six or seven. Uh, it was early in the morning in some cases, so not every student wanted to have camera on 100%. Uh, maybe that was a reason. I don't know. But they were really good about when they were asking a question, when they were contributing a comment. They would turn their camera on. They would leave it on for a little while. Sometimes they would take a break for a minute. Um, you know, so I, I, we want to leave that to sort of our educators building a sense of community with, with our students. Um, uh, we'll, we'll monitor for it. It's a great conversation to, to have with our educators around, you know, is this turning out to be some kind of a, uh, of an issue if our students aren't visibly on the screen 100% of the time, um, for many of the reasons that we want to be sensitive about that, that you raise. Right, thank you. All right, did anybody else have any other questions um, for Ms. Ledesma or for Chief Bird? I have a question. Um, how are we supporting teachers who are parents of students? And, and then there's also a whole child care question. But uh, I wanted this first part, at least, is specifically for um, you're, you're a teacher, you're trying to teach at home, you're eight your eight-year-old um, is trying to be in on a class, the, something happens, they lose contact. 
Sure. Uh, yeah. Well, what, so what's a parent to do? Yeah. So on child care, uh, in uh, child care, big picture, um, I'll I'll sort of refer back to like a lot of our planning is evolving. Um, so we're receiving uh, additional guidance from ODE and then responding. So we should have some pretty uh, definitive uh, plans moving forward around child care uh, later in the week. Um, and so we can speak to that. Um, I might turn it over to Sean to talk a little bit about um, some of the negotiations around the contract with teachers and sort of uh, how that's been uh, discussed um, in terms of supporting them uh, while they're doing that. I think, yeah, I, I don't want to pause it, but I, I think he's got the he's got the right answer right there. Thank you, Danny. I wish uh, I wish I had these answers. Um, so yeah, we did we did talk with our uh, labor partners about that, and you know that's why we that's one of the reasons that we wanted to establish a regular schedule for um, for teachers, and that's one of the reasons that we at, at originally we had thought, well, we'll have um, you know sort of standard schedules across the school district, no matter the level. But then, based on feedback from parents, uh, community members, and uh, and our educators. Uh, they said, you know, uh, we have our own show, we have child care, we've already arranged it, we based it on our schedule that we are normally working. So what can we can we stick with that? So that's why we um, made a modification and uh, stuck with the schedule. Um, and remember that teachers will be uh, online with students sometime. They'll be uh, students will be working independently other times. And that is also um, there's there's time in the day that's built in for parents for teachers who are parents that have to sort of uh, tend to their own children while they're trying to also do their job. So we try to build in some flexibility, of course, um, but you know, their, their primary responsibility, uh, you know, when they're working is, the, is their um, responsibility to their students that they're teaching. And just as we were in the, in the spring, we actually didn't run into too much of, uh, of an issue with that. Uh, we, you know, principals uh, will, Deal with that as as it comes up, but it actually has not was not a, a real issue in the spring uh, that rose to uh, where it was a where it was a real problem. Chair Lauer, if I could ask, and uh, we had a question about how students might feel about cameras on one hundred percent of the time, and I would be curious to to hear as we get underway from the student perspective. But we have student rep Shu here, and I think he was trying to raise his hand, so. Maybe he has a thought on that or maybe a different comment altogether, but I would be curious to hear on the student experience and I'm sure we'll want to share with the board a report out once things are underway. Nathaniel. Yeah, um, in terms of the camera question, um, I do not, I do not think that having any sort of formal policy in place would be a good idea um, for the reasons that have been mentioned, uh, but with that said, I think that it is generally beneficial for people to be on camera. Um, so I guess if we could find a way to encourage students to keep the cameras on without mandating it, especially, you know, if there's a specific issue that they're facing, um, that would be ideal. Um, I also have a few unrelated questions. Um, Why don't you ask them right now? Perfect timing. Uh, great. Um, well, the first one gets back to um, the schedule scheduling that we were talking about earlier. Um, well, it's just, has there been any discussion around retaining any aspects of these new schedules, such as the 4x4 system, for instance, after the pandemic is over and we're back in in-person education? So, so the, the schedule would be the same for this entire academic school year. Uh, so, you know, once you start that, you can't change it in the in midstream. But beyond that, no, we have not um, discussed making uh, formal changes to the high school schedule beyond. I mean, this is definitely a reaction to the to the global pandemic that we're dealing with. OK, so the plan is that after. After this year is over, assuming that COVID has been, for the most part, dealt with, we would be fully back to our normal schedules. That's, that's, our, that's our plan. Okay, sorry, I'm just oh. trying to clarify that. Or in and two then, years or um, three years, whenever it's over. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the other thing was, um, well, I know I've mentioned this in past meetings as well, but I'd just like to follow up um, is there any sort of um, plan regarding 
um, making up missed assignments for high schoolers, because that that sort of thing, I think, is really critical, especially with the four by four schedule. So are you referring to if they, so if you miss an assignment, will you have an opportunity to make it up? Um, yes. OK, so I would say that um, I don't have any concrete answer for that today. I know you and I have talked about it before, so I, I um, I will bring that up at our with our high school principals, um, but you know, of course, we are encouraging, uh, and I know that our teachers are have been uh, flexible, and we're encouraging uh, flexibility for students and for uh, adults in this environment. So I will um, follow up with that, and uh, you and I, I, I think we have another meeting scheduled already, so we can we can discuss that in further detail. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So. Was that okay. your questions, Nathaniel, or did you have another one? Okay, you're all set. All right, Director Consian. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that the staff really took a student's eye view on things tonight, and that's that was a good way for us to walk through it. <clears throat> one of the things I'm curious about is that with our student investment account funds, we just invested in um, a lot more school social workers and counselors and we have our school psychologists. So um, I'm just wondering for those, those specialists in our schools, what does their day look like and how do they get connected with students in need? I understand, Danny, the way you um, portrayed it in terms of a catalog of services that a student can proactively select, um, but, but how are we deploying those employees to really ferret out who needs help? I think, um, you were listening in on some of my meetings today, um, because a lot of the work that we've been talking about is sort of, how do we make sure that there is that like coordination, um, like a real central issue for a lot of our principals and partners has been, how do we make sure that we avoid the situation where one student doesn't have six six people sort of really trying to sort of like land on the student in the family well the student next next to, to that student has zero um and so one of the things that i'm really looking forward to in the next year is really because we have that counselor social worker qualified uh mental health provider is thinking about how they can play a critical role in supporting principles around coordinating these services um, we've talked a lot about the need for uh sort of aligned uh, sort of referral for students, identifying students in need and families in need, um, and then also thinking about how to make sure that the um, the whole set of sort of providers and support are really aligned. And so I've heard principals and um, service providers talking about that critical role of the counselor and the social worker in doing some of that alignment. Thank you. Can I ask you? Uh, can I ask a question about food? Absolutely. Um, my food is at the door. <laughs> it's come, my postmate is coming soon. So let's talk food. <laughs> um, and this is going to get a little wonky, I'm afraid. Um, so one of the ways that we were able to deliver, what was it, 1.2 million um, meals uh, was that there was a waiver in place that allowed us to make use of federal resources, um, but in a in a remote environment. And um, the federal Department of Education has rescinded that waiver now, so it's going to make um, delivery of food, I think, much more complicated. Um, do we? And this is fairly new, so you're allowed to say you're not quite sure how this is going to work yet um but did it has there been any planning around um like do we know how this is going to work and what do we what can we do as a school district and as a larger community to because uh, i'm guessing this is where i i'm guessing we're going to lose some federal resources and um there's huge need in general out in the community. So what can we do? 
So, so I'll let Russ speak to the specifics about um, the funding of our nutrition sites. Uh, he heads up our sort of operational site. But one of the things I'd say in terms of like accessing, uh, because we know that there is going to be an increasing, a more and more increasing um, need for food, um, you'll notice that we have more, uh, I think under, I think it was like Sean's uh, really good idea to make sure that we have more nutrition sites than we had before. And then we're really trying to focus in terms of how it works on making sure that there's that coverage between the days that um, PPS is offering food and and uh, nutrition to our students at those sites, but making sure that th those sites are, that we're really doing really strong communication. So that on those days that it's not available, that the food pantry sites, it's run out of the, um, out of the food bank in partnership with Multnomah County and our Sun providers, that where families can go and access and sort of shop for food at those sites. That they're that we've got every student who's really um, every student and family who knows about that. So David Roy's team is really sort of working on making sure that we're continuing to do those question and answers of like on which days where do we get food, and then what's the the sort of like map of where you go. Um, and so I think what what at least, you know, a quick scan is, is that we've got pretty good geographic coverage as well as that sort of side by side coverage as well. And so we, we really need to make sure that we're doing a good job of communicating that, showing the map. And so I'm, I'm really confident in um, in uh, David's team and sort of making sure that we, we've got that. Um, so the, so the existing model it, the existing model is is still going to be doable under the federal regs now. Um, I'm gonna. I think I see Russ, um, who can talk a little bit more. I haven't been part of the funding conversation for nutrition. So uh, let me uh, lean in on this, uh, Director Moore. Um, to to be perfectly honest, I'm not prepared to talk about the funding uh, component of this. Uh, this would be something that I'd be happy to to return to. Uh, it, as a discussion point for our next meeting. I know our, our food service team has spent a great deal of time planning on, on how to make food available, including uh, even home delivery for some students using uh, our buses as the means to, to get food to, to families. Uh, I also know that they have looked at an expansion of community eligibility uh, as a way to be able to reach more families and provide a larger range of services. Um, but your specific question in terms of the uh, change in uh, the guidance uh, or change in, in the waiver uh, and how that's impacting funding, I'm not prepared to speak to at this point in time. And we do have um, uh, PPS I know right now is actively asking families, the principals are asking families um, if they're unable to come to distribution sites, if they need home delivery and then compiling those lists for our bus drivers. And then also our food pantry partners have their own volunteer networks that deliver the weekly boxes to families who are unable to come and pick them up. So that communication is going on now. And um, Rita, I think it's still a little bit unclear what the USDA um, uh, mean-spirited refusal mm -hmm. to extend the, the waiver um, on the the terms of, of the school lunch program, what that is going to actually look like. But I do know that there is vociferous opposition in Congress and our whole Oregon delegation is working hard on that. And the Council of Great City Schools is working hard on that because it's just plain mean. And um, so uh, we're, we're, we're working on that. And also just don't know exactly what those changes mean in terms of in, prohi inhibiting us from getting food to kids. Thank you, Dr. Constam. All right, we only have- I have one more comment. I've got one more comment about the food. I was gonna say we haven't heard from Michelle or Andrew. So I was just gonna say five minutes left. Okay. Michelle or Andrew, do you have anything to add? Just on the topic of food again, um, I'm wondering if, um, if we have the capacity to sort of map out some of the other uh, other providers um, in the network partner partner organizations such as the Oregon Food Bank, um, independent pantries, um, so we can help uh, our, the people within our, within our system. Um, also, you know, partnering with um, our, our culturally um, specific organizations and two on one. So kind of everyone knows the lay of the land where food is available should they need it. 
So, uh, Director DePass, this is David Roy. <clears throat> we did, uh, in the spring, uh, we put together a composite map that included our own uh, PPS school meal distribution sites, as well as sites in organizations uh, such as the ones you're referring to. We will be doing that again so that uh, in the next couple of days, someone could go to our website uh, and find not only where uh, meals will be distributed at our own schools, but find a lot of that information, including some sites where, uh, where there are food pantries and other uh, similar services. So we will definitely be sharing that. We will also, like we do with anything that is uh, truly sort of fundamental for our families to know, uh, we will, we are making sure, as uh, Danny mentioned, that we are uh, communicating this in a number of ways, right? So not just email or web, but over social. We'll be sending text, robocall, working with our principals who communicate this directly to their respective school communities and making sure our community partners know that as well so they can disseminate it as well. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew, did you have a comment or question? Yeah, just a real question going. First of all, thank you. I mean, this was an incredible amount of information. I, I really appreciate and and I'm hoping the public is watching or, or that they can go back and, and look at the slideshow, the, the complexity that went into um, planning the scheduling, planning the wraparound services and student supports is, is incredible. So, so thank you for all that work. Going way back uh, to Dr. Bird's presentation, I, I realized there was a question about um, scheduling. So I, I and I, I really did appreciate sort of going through from a student centered lens. When you talked about the IB students, students at IB program, um, again, it wasn't 100 percent clear. Are they doing something different than the four by four? And, and how is that working with with sort of um, students at, at Cleveland or, or Lincoln who are not going to be going for the IB? Thank you. Uh, so they are doing a full year schedule as they have now. So you saw eight periods instead of uh, four that they'll rotate through through the whole year. And at uh, both schools, because of the complexity of the IB program and really it being a two year program that requires uh, the additional time, all students at Cleveland take some uh, IB class. So it is an IB for all schools. So every student would be involved some way in AP. Um, where you will see a variation of that uh, is in the um, and 10th grade where um, you know, th they might not need a um, full eight classes, but because of Division 22 requirements, they uh, students have to be scheduled for full uh, time load. So um, if they're whatever their schedules, they have to be scheduled for that, except for seniors who can be scheduled for six. Uh, so um, what, what you saw in that example, though, was even so that student was a full IB diploma student. So she had some uh, eight, she had some IB study periods built into her schedule, so not all those classes are academic, so it lightened their load. Students that are not participating fully in IB will have more elective choices, so they may be able to be in the band and also have an art class and also and also have a study hall to help support their academics. So they'll still have the same credit. Um, everybody in high school in our high schools will have the same opportunity to earn the same number of credits. It's just how you dice it up over the year. Um, but there will you you need six credits to be on track for graduation each year. Uh, so um, and you know those are made up of some requirements and then electives. So the students at those schools, though, the high percentage of them, which is why we had to stay with the year long schedule and make some modifications in terms of the rigor of the schedule because of the high number of students that participate in the IB program at both of those schools. So I appreciate that it does it it it'll, it it's going to create an interesting situation in the district, right, where I think we'll actually have an opportunity to look at how students are are, are performing at, at Cleveland and, and Lincoln versus other schools that other high schools that have gone to the four by four schedule. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I met with the DSC earlier tonight, you know, they have a lot of questions about scheduling and, you know, and, and I get a, a ton of emails from people um, sort of, you know, why aren't we still doing eight? That's better than four. And, and you know, I think this is one of those moments where um, none of you are all educational experts and throughout the country you're having these conversations um and i trust that um that you are you know moving towards what is sort of the consensus view right around what's going to be best for the students um and, and i think you know I, it makes sense to me why a four by four schedule might might make sense I, I think this is an opportunity to sort of see how that's working um i would really encourage um the principals at those two high schools as well as as area senior directors and, and staff to be really focused on the um, students in those schools who might not be going for full IB, um, who might actually um, be struggling. I mean, if, if this theory about um, online learning and the challenges is correct, um, you know, we, we've made accommodations now for the IB students, um, but perhaps those accommodations will actually do harm or damage to the non-IB diploma students. 
Um, and so I appreciate that you've taken that into account. We're talking about electives. I think it's going to be really important for us to put a, a lot of focus in, and, and I think that should be an expectation of, of the principals, teachers, and, and staff um, at those schools to make, be making sure that those children, or those students are not dropping through the cracks. Um, and at the time, one of the questions that I got from one of the DOs, uh, uh, one of Nathaniel's colleagues is, um, you know, well, what if the or is not working, right? And and how will we know that? And as you said, we're going to stick with the schedule all year because we need to do that. That's important to have that consistency. But I think we also need to be willing to step back after a few months and, and ask that question as well. Is it working the way we assumed it would be working? Is it helping students get through this, um, you know, uh, pandemic, you know, virtual learning environment better? Um, or or maybe there are some, some other models that, that would work as well. And and Dr. Penn, Chair or Chief, I am like, what is your title, Sean? Chief Bird, if you could go ahead <laughs> and respond to Andrew sure. you know, comments uh, through an email, that'd be great. And I know we may have more questions about um, reentry, um, and we'll we'll continue to adapt and learn as we go. And if if there are any other questions from directors, please feel free to email um, Sean and Danny because I know they have nothing else to do other than respond to <laughs> emails, right? No. <laughs> hey, this is you have a question. Go ahead. Uh, so through, through our uh, thing, we're going to go ahead and move on, Director Constam, to the okay, rest. Just of a second, please. Tonight. So we had another item on our agenda tonight that I think we've missed, which was yeah, we've, we've got it. Yeah. Date on enrollment. Sorry, what was uh, that, Chief Bird? We had another item on our agenda for tonight in the reentry presentation that was um, just a status report on our enrollment, Chief Bird. Yes, so we are, um, I know that we've gotten questions about kindergarten enrollment, is it up or down? And so uh, it was a bit lower at the, when I last checked, but we are, you know, now uh, people are interacting with school more, we're doing uh, uh, different kinds of outreach. So we'll have, uh, we'll be able to send you updated numbers. Um, and we're also, uh, have been, I, we've been working with the Office of Enrollment and Transfer to uh, see uh, in areas where if there is a lower uh, turnout, excuse me, it's my dog. If there's a lower turnout, then uh, they can do, <laughs> sorry, for, they can do an enrollment fair. Okay, uh, enrollment we'll fair. let you go know, and you can send us an email, but I'm, I'm interested in those numbers as well as um, the numbers of our students that we're seeing enroll in the state virtual charter school and just the, um, the attrition um, at, at various grade levels. So keep us posted. All right, thank you. Um, we're gonna move on now to our committee reports, but before we get there, um, Director Scott actually caught that we um, missed a resolution. So um, we had a resolution in the agenda that went out to everyone that was labeled 6165, but then when Director Moore made her resolution, we labeled that one 6165. Um, so we had two 6165s tonight. Um, so in order to make sure that our record and intent are clear, um, we as a voter, board are going to need, need to re-vote together on both the original resolution 6165 related to a settlement and what should have been numbered 6166, which is the preschool for all measure. Does that make sense to everybody? So 6165 is settlement, 6166 is resolution. Okay. And if I could ask you to mute, if you're not speaking, that would be great. Um, so we are going to go ahead and move those two resolutions to make them clear, both 6165 and 6166. Do I have a motion and a second on those two resolutions? So moved. I heard seconded. Michelle seconded. Sorry, Director Scott and Director DePoss. Um, the board will now vote on resolution 6165. All uh, in favor, please indicate by saying yes. 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 All opposed, please indicate by saying no. Are there any abstentions? All right, resolutions 6165 and 6166 are approved, are approved by a vote of seven to zero with student representative Shu voting. Yes. All right, we're gonna move on to the committee and conference reports. Um, Rita, could you please provide your policy committee update? Well, we had a meeting yesterday of the policy committee. Um, we got some updates on some policies that are currently in the middle of community engagement. Um, we talked about a new protocol that we're um, gonna start to use 
uh, around uh, community engagement related to the policy work. Um, and the upshot is that we're going to try to do the community engagement work, um, trying to front load that uh, as opposed to doing it at the back end. Um, we also talked about, um, what did we talk about? That was 24 hours ago, who remembers? Um, we also talked about some upcoming policies that we're uh, we're looking to either revise or um, do kind of um, additional criteria for. One of them is the real estate policy, where we're we're going to be looking at establishing criteria that could be used in the event that um, the board or the district wanted to um, have. Um, lease agreements that deviated somehow from the um, from the standard policy and um, and practices. Um, and then we got uh, we got the annual report on the complaints um, over the last school year, 2019-20. Uh, and um, um, we're going to be looking at any kind of um, improvements to the process that uh, we might want to consider. It was just the it was the the first um, kind of the first attempt to look at how the policy has played out on the ground over the last two years, and um, staff will be coming back to us at the next uh, policy committee meeting with some recommendations for um, some slight amendments to the policy. That's it. And we're meeting again in three weeks. Any other um, committee reports or um, other conference reports that need to occur right now? I have a conference a committee report. Um, so from the audit committee, um, we I want to thank we're we're welcoming two uh, student reps to the audit committee. Uh, part. Parker Myris and Jackson Weinberg. So uh, we're really glad that they're willing to serve this year. Um, in addition, um, the longest serving audit committee member in recent memory is um, cycling off Kari Guy. Um, she's been a great addition over several iterations of the committee. Um, so we'll have an opening on the committee and I'm working uh, with Director Pass and then the other members of the audit committee um, to get the word out about the opening and hopefully we'll have that filled before we get our work started this year. And then the last thing is on August 30th, there's going to be a joint bond and audit uh, committee meeting on the 2019-2020 um, in independent performance audit of the bond. Um, so that'll be bringing together the both committees to get that bond, re that bond audit report. And speaking of the bond, vote in November. <laughs> Excuse me, vote yes in November. <laughs> Scott, Scott amends my uh, statement to say vote yes in November. Uh, <laughs> Director Brim Edwards, um, did you have anything else to add about the bond at this time? About the bond? Um, no, only that uh, I think there are probably two notable milestones. One, um, our ballot title um, has passed the deadline. So we have an established uh, ballot title. It took, a, I think it took a longer, longer to get out of the board um, <laughs> than it did across the finish line um, into a, a, being a coming of official ballot title. So that's great news. Um, in addition, we have um, a, um, our general consultant for the campaign who has um, hired a campaign staff and we're ready to hit the ground running and um, There'll be more, I think, with the start of school that we'll want to share with our broader school community. All right, any other reports before we move on to the consent agenda? Dr. I just would, uh, would add that uh, if there's any of you out there in the community who would like uh, to have a presentation about the bond at uh, any group that you're engaged in, whether it's school related or a community group, we'd be glad to help you out with that. Um, just uh, contact, well, Director Brim Edwards is our fearless leader of the bond campaign. All right, we're gonna move on to the items from the consent agenda that um, were pulled, um, which 
sorry, I muted myself instead of switching to the script. Um, it's I, it's only eight o'clock, but apparently I'm acting like it's midnight. Um, so those are the three um, contracts that were pulled. And I know, Director Brim Edwards, you had a question about another contract that wasn't pulled. Um, so why don't you ask your question about the one contract that wasn't pulled first, and then we'll get to the three contracts that were pulled. Does that make sense? It does. And actually, um, one, one of the, uh, the question about the cat catapult contract is the same as the other three contracts um, on one of the items. So the business agenda describes for the contracts as running from 920 um, or September 1, uh, 2020 to June 30th, 2021, but with an option to renew the four additional one year terms. If you, if as a community member or if you just look at it, it might look like that we're approving one year, a, a one year approval of it, but it's actually, um, and then you come back next year for an extension. But in fact, tonight when we vote on them, um, it's board approval of a 40 year contract. And um, I know based on the Student Success Act community focus groups, um, we heard about the importance of multi year contracts from our community partners. And my question is if these are actually multi year contracts, not one year contracts, when and where will the actual annual performance reporting um, be done and, and how will it be reported out? Because it, it won't be coming back to the board again next, next year in theory. I, I also see a typo in resolution 6162 um, on new contracts regarding catapult learning. It, it has the contract term 91 2020 through 83121. So I don't know if that's a typo. Did we mean that to say the contract goes through June 30, 21, like the others? So I can speak to the reporting question and then um, I'll let folks or speak to the typo. Um, so as far as the when the board will have access to the performance reports, uh, one of the ways that we're moving towards more transparency is that each quarter we're going to be updating our RESJ partnership website. Um, so in about, about a month ago, I sent you all a memo with uh, that contained a link to the current uh, website. Once all of our contracts are um, are sort of passed and finalized. We'll update the website with the specific um, sort of scope of work for each of our contractors. And then once a quarter, we will um, we will publish the reporting uh, on the, the sort of progress of our contractors. So the first question I would say is that the board as well as the public will have access to this uh, to this uh, to the contract. Uh, performance. Um, additionally, the superintendent um, has been convening our partners um, where we are intending to kind of shift the agenda to those uh, convenings to really talk about performance. Um, we've talked with our partners about the shift and they're really excited. So we want to uh, make this a venue uh, where we're um, talking not only about individual performance, but also the collective performance of our contractors. Um, they're really interested and engaged around the ideas of sort of how they are surfacing best practices amongst themselves um, and really committed to our goal uh, of really increasing the impact of these contracts. Um, and so also really committed to working out where, where things may not be going as well and sort of how to mitigate for those issues. Um, I'm also uh, really happy um, that you all have been so engaged around these partners. Um, I think uh, once we get re-entry down, uh, these contracts get get finalized, we'd like to kind of bring each of our partners uh, by strategy in front of the board to really get, give you more information about what exactly they're doing. Um, and so you'll have a, a chance to kind of hear a little bit about their past work as well as sort of their work moving forward. So um, one of the goals that we have uh, with, these, with these partnerships and through the investment strategy that, that um, I'm happy to resend the link to you all is increasing the transparency um, and really publishing uh, not only to to our board and to our our own PPS community, but to the um, to the partner community at large is making sure that folks know that we are engaging with these partners, not just because they're culturally specific partners, but because of the strategies that really tie into our theory of action. When we talk about braiding those racial equity strategies, our partners are executing on these strategies. 
So I'm prepared to respond to um, the question about the timing on the contract for catapult learning, and it is not a typo. This is federal grant Title I funding, and that aligns to the federal um, fiscal year. Okay, um, Director Brim Edwards, what are your, you're muted right now. Um, what are your questions about the other three contracts or comments? I don't think I'm muted, am I? You're unmuted now, but you were muted earlier. Okay. I try and be well trained so I don't get texts from Director Bailey. Um, so um, th these questions, and they're primarily directed at the district, not the community contractors. Um, so most of these contractors are all of them um, we have on tonight, uh, previously held contracts with the district. In the past, we had the previous year's quarterly and year end reports, which informed the staff and the board of the efficacy of the contract in terms of students supports or outcomes um, and what adjustments might be made in the future before we approve contracts. Um, obviously, this last year, those reports would have been impacted by um, COVID, at least at the year end. Um, and it sounds like with this new um, system, that Ms. Ledesma just described um, that there's there will be a different process that will be posted. My question is, um, given the fact that it's now um, we'll have that after the contract renewal, how is how is it that staff um, will incorporate any learnings or improvements from the reports into the contract re into the contract renewals? So did that, for the example, did that already happen, the contracts that we have coming to us? How? Uh, sure. So thank you for your question, Director Brim Edwards. So the, um, what I would say is that a lot of the learning came in through our redesign process, and I'm, I'm happy it was a, probably too long of a memo, but about a month ago, um, I sent the board a memo describing our sort of like redesign of these, of these, uh, uh, of these contracts. So while we um, while we have reviewed their reports and their performance um, from the last year, we um, what was the most instructive in the execution of this this set of contracts that you're um, that we're asking you to approve tonight and subsequent ones that we'll be asking you at, at um, later board meetings has been our RFP process. So we heard from our community, we heard from um, our district about really wanting to. Um, put these contracts out to bid. Um, the contract, uh, the RFP process was informed by uh, a, a pretty thoroughly researched, uh, uh, culturally responsive, uh, racial equity, social justice um, investment strategy. Um, so we asked our partners to submit not only uh, sort of how they would uh, sort of, you know, uh, sort of uh, pro provide services, but we also asked them questions about how they've uh, provided services in the past. Um, we had a review team that was pretty significant. We had uh, multiple departments that were uh, that were involved and we also had uh, multiple people. Um, so I think we had like close to 15 people who were who were part of the review and they represented uh, they represented staff from uh, the Office of uh, Teaching and Learning, Office of School Performance, uh, Community Engagement, myself, uh, principals um, uh, from uh, middle school, high school, and grade school. Um, so we had a, a really wide range of folks. And so the um, I really think about this year as a reset and the RFP as being the primary predictor of sort of how we are um, intending to sort of move forward with these set of contracts. So this is almost a reset. So we certainly took into account past performance, um, but uh, the RFP was the most instructive in um, in, in the, sc the resulting scores and uh, is what was most instructive in uh, the contracts that you have before you right now. Great, thanks. So I, and I appreciate you uh, mentioning the memo because it, it was awesome. And if we don't have this posted somewhere, I think it should be because it gives, I think, a really clear blueprint of how we're thinking about this in a comprehensive systemic way um and I, I think in the past contract oversight has been um an issue for pps um at least episodically and so i think the system that's been laid out here um provides a really clear transparent template um and when you reference the reset i think um maybe my next question it's a uh, just function of the reset um the reset year versus um an ongoing um issue but 
when I look through uh, the board contract, the board cover memos um, for two of the contracts, um, the cover memo said that there were SMART goals, which are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. Um, that those those goals were incorporated into, into the contract in Exhibit A. When you went through the contract, um, the actual contract, but there are hundreds of pages. Um, the contract said the SMART goals are still being developed and won't be available to September 30th. And that's sort of a two part, a two, yeah. a two part, a two part question related to that. One um, is that just a function of the reset, like going forward, they would actually be baked into. Um, any contract that the board approved and then 2nd, um, given that we're in a transition year, um, once those have been set, can those be shared with the board in October once they've been set since we're approving the contract without the minute. Um, so, absolutely, we, we intend to share share those as part of our ongoing work. Um, what I would say is that um, the contracts as uh, as provided um, in both section in both the section in terms of goals and activities, as well as our performance measures, um, they do have smart goals and that they are they are um, they are measurable. They are time bound. We're asking them to uh, do that. Um, in our in the research in the research and, and literature review that we did to inform the investment strategy, uh, three indicators were found to be one of the one of the the most impactful in terms of in, increasing student performance uh, for students of color. The first was the strategy themselves, right? So we have contractors that are reporting on the activities conducive to the strategy um, and how it aligns to the strategy. And so that is that is something that they are currently reporting on and that they will report on quarterly. And you see that uh, tracked in both their activities and the, the goals that are outlined. The second indicator was having that sort of demographic match of the of the staff who are doing that and so that is something that is also reported. You'll notice a section in the performance measures that says, um, that says um, uh, staff demographics as well as the FTE and the time spent. Um, and then the third indicator was, um, as Dr. Brown, uh, our chief of systems performance, likes to say the dosing or basically the intensity of services. So we're asking folks to also tell us how often or how long are you going to be uh, uh, working with each student? So the document that you're requesting, um, the sort of shared outcome report, is in the past we've had our partners, um, we've said, we'd like you to increase attendance. Uh, and so um, a certain percentage of the students attending your program will, will have 90% attendance. And so what we, uh, functionally the process was, is that our, our contractors would uh, call uh, Pamela, um, ask Pamela to produce a report that has the attendance and then they would um, they would receive that report from Pamela and then they would return that report to me. Um, so what we're trying to do is to uh, is to have the district report out the actual outcomes. Um, and uh, so so part of what the process that we're doing and just today um, we had a, a great meeting with open school and the, the three high school principals. Um, and we're doing this with all of our contractors is that we are sort of everyone's, you know, across zoom looking each other in the eyes saying sort of like, these are the performance measures. These are the goals. We're reviewing the scope of work very carefully. Russ is attending each of the Dr. Brown, excuse me, is attending each of those meetings um, and together we'll co create that shared sort of outcome report. Uh, we don't have that for you tonight because of a couple of factors. Uh, we need to, after all the contracts are reported, be able to sort of go back and review and calibrate uh, sort of like what baseline will be. And there's a couple of factors around the baseline. So we don't have it for you, number one, because uh, we're still negotiating all the contracts. So we want to make sure that this is a shared report. Um, the second reason is that, uh, and I think we talked about this in email, is that um, the, uh, the ba what's baseline is a little bit wonky this year, right? <laughs> um, so, so there are a couple of uh, factors outside of our control, such as timing of assessments, uh, sort of attendance, and sort of how that will be taken. That we want to make sure that we're spending a little bit more time uh, before we establish that baseline, and then each 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 group will be sort of. Uh, aspiring towards a more specific of sort of like what that percentage increase year by year. Um, the one thing I would say is that we're in really good company. 
So the outcomes that we're reporting on are pretty shared by a lot of other funders who are doing similar work that we are. So Meyer Memorial Trust, uh, the Children's Levy, Multnomah County, we're all reporting on very similar, similar things. And so one of the things that I'm really excited about the way that we're looking at performance measures is that we're, we're wanting to make sure that we understand what the leverage is. So what FTE are we paying for? What FTE is Multnomah County paying for? Is Meyer Memorial Trust paying for? And how can, through the use of a, some common outcomes, can we really look across the, the whole array of funding that goes into supporting students and their learning to make sure that we are aware of what, what impact we're, you know, sort of we're funding and, and what that looks like. So I'm really excited to have Dr. Brown and his big brain uh, part of this. Um, and I think we're we're really close, but there are some there are some procedural processes that we that we need to go through to make sure that it's in alignment. So just a clarifying question. So in the past, say an individual contractor it would have been, I'm gonna I'm gonna do these activities with this number of students at these schools, and we're going to increase the percentage of those students uh, attending school at a 80% level or pick pick some measurement. Are you saying now that those goals are going to be are going to be collective group goals or you'd still have an individual contractor who would have like an attendance base goal? So I'm just trying to understand if we've had a, a big shift to a collective goal that everybody's going to be accountable for or is it still going to be like hey, at Madison Roosevelt um, with this cohort of students, we're going to be moving achievement or we're going to be um, trying to increase attendance or some other measurement. Uh, the goals have always been collective. So, um, so contractor A was trying to get to the same sort of like shared outcomes that contractor B was. Uh, what we're doing is sort of recalibrating what that baseline is to get more accurate, uh, more accurate uh, picture of what um, sort of realistic growth would be. What that sort of um, in terms of a smart goal, what that sort of attainable but also stretch goal would be. Okay, thank you. Director or Chair Lowry, just uh, just to jump in um, really quickly, I, I actually just I, I actually found some of the performance metrics in these contracts to be really um, rigorous, and I appreciate uh, Danny's sort of explanation as I was going through just just looking at you know students served and hours per week and diversity of staff. I mean these are um, these are out, output measures for sure, but they're output measures that are leading and consistent with our board goals um, and sort of the explanation that we're hearing tonight about moving towards the shared outcomes. Um, is is a really positive step as well, and and this is something that's in process. You know, and in terms of the overall timing, I actually think we've 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 hit this just right. There were three options for these contracts. One of them would have been an annual contract, which I think we did here, as Director Brim Edwards said from the community and our partners, that that that's really problematic. And I think governments that have dealt with um, community uh, based organizations know that 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 type of annual funding with the uncertainty makes it really hard for them to staff up, makes it hard for them to to plan for the future. Um, so I think a one-year contract would have been a mistake. The other option, you know, would have been a four-year contract, um, which which would have been fine, but it doesn't allow for as much um, sort of checking in and accountability. So I think I think where district staff ended up with with a one-year contract with 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 um, extensions, if the you know if our contractors if our partners are meeting goals, is exactly the right place to be because it gives some of that long-term certainty, but it also allows staff to be checking in. Um, and really coming back and, and again, holding holding folks accountable for, for achieving this. I will say I've read a lot of government contracts and I actually found the performance measures in these um, to be really um, solid and rigorous and, and pretty refreshing. So um, good job. And I, I look forward to the shared outcomes report um, once that's developed and, and, and seen, seen, seen uh, how, how these efforts are actually moving towards our, our shared board goals. So thanks. All right, uh, it sounds like we're ready to um, consider these contracts. Um, so, uh, I need a motion and a second to bring these three contracts forward as um, part of resolution 6162A. Can I do that, Liz, or do we have to do 6167? I, I think I would prefer 6167, but it's it's actually clear which ones you're voting on, and that's the most important piece, that it's the Open School, ERCO, and IM Academy contracts. Great. So we'll do 6167, ERCO, I am Academy, and one school. Open. Yeah. Okay. I think I called it so, the thing earlier. Yes. So moved. Let's Director Scott and Director Bailey. I think Director. So moved. Director Scott moved and Director Bailey Second. seconded. 
there's a lot going on. I don't know if my internet connect connection is bad, but director, I heard director Scott and director Bailey on that one. All right. Um, close enough. Close enough. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Um, all right. Uh, is there any further discussion on these? All right. Um, we will now vote on 6166. All in favor, please uh, affirm no, by no. saying yes. 6167. 6167. Ah, 6166 was the preschool one. All right. We're voting on 6167. Um, all in favor, please indicate by saying yes. 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 All opposed, uh, please indicate by saying no. All right, 6167 passes 7 to 0 with student representative Chu voting. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Okay. That has passed. And then uh, I think we, we have uh, one other final piece of business that I know about before we adjourn, Director Bailey. Yes. Uh, yes. Let's see. Am I, I'm unmuted. Okay, good. Um, so to close off the evening on uh, to me a really exciting and positive note. It's really nice when you work hard and you get a little recognition for it. So I want to uh, share with the public that uh, our superintendent is getting some well deserved recognition. Uh, every year, the Hispanic Metropolitan Chamber celebrates the contributions of Latinos, both locally and nationally. And this year, they have they are honoring Superintendent, Superintendent Guerrero with the Bravo Award for Educational Leadership. Uh, the award recognizes him for his work to improve the education for Portland's children. And he'll receive the award uh, during a celebration on September 10th. So, Superintendent Bravo, well done. We are so glad you are here leading us. Thank you, Director Bailey. Uh, you can't tell that I'm blushing through the sunburn, um, but certainly <laughs> any credit or accolade uh, is, is, is best uh, situated with, with the team effort here. So, uh, we're always happy and glad for uh, positive recognition. Uh, it beats the alternative, but thank you. So uh, we are now officially adjourning and our next meeting will be September 8th at 6 p.m. So uh, see you back then on the 8th. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.